Good evening and uh, welcome to the uh, Monday, May 17th City Council work session. We're going to be reviewing homelessness and sheltering updates and planning uh, several uh, programs uh, that should be very interesting. Uh, I appreciate it if the uh, recorder please call the roll. Councillor Stapleton. Here. Councillor Anderson. Present. Councillor Phillips. Here. Councillor Leon. Here. Councillor Gonzalez. Councillor Hoy. Here. Councillor Nordyke. Here. Councillor Lewis. Mayor Bennett. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoy, do we have additions and deletions? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to then call on Steve Powers to kind of set the stage for us. Ah, oh, here's Councillor Lewis. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, no, you're fine. No problem. I have you down. Thank you. Okay, Steve, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Uh, yes, this evening is an opportunity for City Council to mm -hmm. receive an update from the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance. And then the second part of the work session will be uh, presentations and discussions uh, with city staff regarding the city's uh, specific sheltering efforts that are underway, including the uh, discussion of the sheltering in the, the two city parks. Uh, Councilor Hoy is city council's representative on the Alliance. And I would like to have uh, Councilor Hoy uh, introduce our guests and, and introduce the uh, first part of tonight's work session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Uh, the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance uh, was formed to develop evidence based an evidence based system of services, including stable housing designed to meet the unique and complex needs of adults, youth, children and families in Marion and Polk counties who are at risk of experiencing homelessness. The board is, uh, as the city manager mentioned, I'm uh, your representative to that board and it's comprised of government and nonprofit decision makers as well as representatives with lived experience in homelessness. Uh, some of the some of the entities that are uh, that participate are the city of Salem, Kaiser, Monmouth, Independence, both Marion and Polk counties, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Salem Kaiser School District, the housing authorities in Salem, Marion County, and West Valley, also the Polk County Veteran Services Office, and we have uh, some nonprofits including United Way, Salem Health, Union Gospel Mission and uh, the Community Action Agency. And uh, the Alliance is chaired by Kathy Clark, the mayor of Kaiser, and I serve as the vice chair. And the Alliance uh, has, I think, served a remarkable purpose in that it has broken down silos and helped facilitate relationships that are helping to build a broad spectrum of services across the entire two county region. It's not just in Salem, it's not just in Kaiser, it's all across uh, the two counties. And uh, we have engaged the services of professional consultants who do the bulk of the hands-on work for the Alliance. And we have two of the individuals here tonight and they, I have to tell you, do remarkable work on the Alliance's behalf and therefore on your behalf. And uh, that is uh, former Marion County Commissioner, Janet Carlson and Jan Calvin. And they're gonna provide the bulk of the presentation tonight, but the three of us will be available to answer questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Janet Carlson. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, uh, City Manager Powers, for helping us get this uh, scheduled and for the City Council and the Mayor for having us here tonight. And uh, we, our third uh, consultant that's not with us tonight is Carla Munns. And so I'll just introduce her and then Jan Calvin, of course. Uh, I understand that your uh, format is has been somewhat formal with work sessions and that you wait until I'm done and then you're gonna ask questions. And I would just say, if you wanna break that tradition tonight and uh, ask questions as we go along or make a comment, that's perfectly okay. I would rather not have you hold questions all the way through and then ask something that we talked about way at the beginning of the uh, presentation, if you have something that you'd like to say or something that you'd like to ask. So I'll just throw that out there. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, we're happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna bring up the uh, PowerPoint presentation All right, very good. And uh, this is a presentation actually that Emily Enders uh, from your staff helped us put together. So this is our progress report. Uh, we were last with you, I think about two years ago in 2019, 
when we were when this was just an idea to form this uh, continuum of care. And so here we are back again to tell you how we've done. So the first uh, part of the presentation, we want to talk a bit about who who is homeless, who are these people that we're concerned about that are uh, without homes. Uh, and we want to talk about what's driving homelessness in our two county region of Marion and Polk counties. So first of all, how, who is homeless? Uh, one of the problems that we have is that our data quality still needs improvement. We've been working really hard on that. Uh, one of the major things that we're addressing as an alliance. So the numbers on this slide are taken from what they call coordinated entry data. And that data is entered into a common database, which is called the Homeless Management Information System. At this point in time, there were about 1,100 people experiencing homelessness. This was, uh, the source was June 2020. Uh, unfortunately, depending on how you slice and dice it, how, what point in time you take that data, it can vary a lot. And you've seen different figures in newspapers and you've used different figures, I'm sure. Uh, so one of the things that we're working on is a data dashboard where we can all agree on what the data is and all agree on how many people out there are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we also included a group that we call the chronically homeless. Uh, these are people who have been on the streets a long time, often experiencing both mental health and addictions issues. The Marion Polk region has a much higher percentage of chronically homeless individuals, 49% compared with 17% nationally and 37% in Oregon. Again, I'll say 49% in Marion and Polk, 17 nationally, 37 in Oregon. Marion Polk region also has a high percentage of families who experience chronic homelessness. So now here's another way to look at the numbers. These are school numbers. Uh, and sometimes one of the reasons that we put this is because we're giving this presentation throughout the Marion and Polk region. And oftentimes, it's easy for people to say, well, homelessness is a Salem problem or homelessness is a Portland problem. And we think it's very important that we have a regional approach. Uh, so these numbers are obviously reported by school districts and it shows that homelessness is prevalent throughout uh, our school districts in Marion and Polk counties. Homelessness can happen to anyone. We often hear, I often hear people say, uh, well, isn't being homeless a choice? How many of you have heard, have been asked that question? Uh, for most people experiencing homelessness, it really is not their choice. Uh, the following story that I'm gonna read to you was posted on Facebook by a social service worker based on her client's experiences. And I found it very compelling and I, I'll share it with you now. You're a single parent with a child. You work full time for $14. You bring home roughly $800 per paycheck. Your bills are $1,000 for rent, $150 for electricity, $250 for your car payment. Let's do the math. You bring home about $1,600 a month and your bills average $1,400. You're, you're making it, but barely, but this doesn't include groceries, gas, or car insurance. It's a really cold December and you get a power bill for $600. How do you pay that? To put it simply, you can't, so your power gets shut off. Your lease says you'll be evicted if your utilities are terminated. Now you're in court and you have 10 days to get out. You're in luck. You found somewhere else to live with three days to spare and it's only $650 a month. But to get in, you have to pass a background check and a credit check, which you can't do because you just got evicted. And even if you could pass it, you're looking at $1,300 to move in after paying the deposit and the first month's rent. Your landlord shows up at 7 a.m. with the police and changes your locks. Now you're living in your car with your seven-year-old son and everything you need to get by in your back seat. You tried to rent a storage unit, but you don't have a billing address. You pay to shower at local truck stops and eat whatever can be cooked in a gas station microwave. Someone sees you and your son living like this and calls Child Protective Services. They remove your child from your care. As if this isn't devastating enough, you lose your job too because an employee losing a child reflects poorly on this company. You apply for a low income apartment where the waiting list is three to seven years. Then you go into Walmart to put in a job application. When you get back into your car, your back window has been smashed and someone helped themselves to your belongings. Remember that it is winter and really cold and now you have damage to your only shelter. You call your insurance agent who says your deductible is $1,000 and they're going to increase your monthly rate since now you're high risk. You call the homeless shelter as a last resort and all their beds are full. I think you get the point. The people we work with every day are these people. 
We are all so close to homelessness and don't even realize it. All it takes is one unexpected bill, one fender bender, one layoff, one house fire. So what does research say are the top causes of homelessness? Uh, you can see them on the slide here. Uh, a couple of them, lack of affordable housing. I think this is something that this community uh, really suffers from. And then of course, domestic violence is for women, the leading cause of homelessness. We have a strong uh, partnership with the uh, Marion and Polk County domestic violence shelters and uh, programs and are working with them as part of the Alliance. Janet, so, Janet, yeah. Janet, excuse me, I'm gonna take you up on your offer. Sure, uh, yeah. I'm happy. Um, a, a couple things, the, the figures obviously are, uh, you know, you said 1188 and they, they add up to more. So I presume there's some people who might be chronic and in families and some people chronic single. Um, but my other question is uh, relating to uh, the slide you just showed. My presumption is that the causes there, uh, yeah, it's on the screen now, that's in order of magnitude. In other words, insufficient income, poverty is the first one and substance abuse is the bottom one. Or is that true? Or can you so say? My recollection in looking at the article was that they didn't state that they were necessarily in priority order, that okay. they were just okay. various reasons for um, for homelessness. Obviously, insufficient income and poverty would be a huge factor in that. Uh, Thanks. And depending on your community, so mental illness and substance abuse, as I mentioned earlier with chronic homelessness, we have significant percentages of people in our community that that have that i'm going to ask jan calvin jan are you can you unmute yourself to just talk for a minute about the numbers in terms of uh the uh homeless management information system versus the point in time count uh the different ways of slicing and dicing the data to arrive at how many people are homeless yeah jan. Definitely. thank you for the opportunity so I believe people have heard of the point in time count. It is exactly that. It happens all across the nation the last week of January of all times. And uh, for us in 21, that included um, some snow. But at any rate, uh, trying to capture people on a one day, um, the problem with that is weather, but it's also the issues of how many volunteers do you get out and how well coordinated and just what is the luck of the draw on that day. Um, HUD did allow us some extra time because of COVID, so it went longer than a day, it went a full week. But at any rate, uh, those numbers fluctuate from year to year so dramatically because not just the changes that could be happening around who is homeless, but how do you find? So it's really the changes of how many people were you able to count is really the data. And so trying to say who is really homeless relying on pit count or point in time count data is uh, less than ideal. However, with our homeless management information system, again, not uh, everybody gets an assessment and is documented in the database. So we know we're undercounting there also. However, it's um, a broader reach and it's uh, cumulative over time. And we can slice and dice from either a period of when they were first assessed or people who've been contacted um, and been in touch with a provider, any number of providers within the, within the last 30 days. So they're what we would call actively homeless and actively contacted uh, and searching and being a part of trying to become more stable in their housing. So we look at it, uh, as we said, a data dashboard is what we're trying to put together. There's one other number that Janet showed of the over 1900 homeless students. Now granted there was 1188 homeless people, but 1,900 homeless students. How does that work? Well, the Department of Education counts homelessness differently than HUD does. So when we talk of literally homeless, that was the 1188. Some of those are students within school districts, but the additional students that are counted by the uh, Department of Education definition are people who are doubled up or they may be in hotel motel system situations for extended period of time. So they are sheltered homeless versus literally homeless. Again, many ways to look at it. Thank you. So to recap, what I hope you take away from this discussion is that there are a lot of different reason, reasons that people become homeless. 
and that makes the issue that much more difficult to solve. Uh, approaches are going to vary depending on if you're working with a youth, with a veteran, with women and children, or with someone with a mental health condition. Uh, so now we're going to move into our table of contents, uh, which includes our mission, our structure, our goals, and our plan. So Chris did a nice job of reciting the mission statement. Jan actually did a quiz on this at our last board meeting. Uh, and again, it's to develop an evidence-based system of services. So we're really interested in looking at approaches that work. And these include stable housing, and they're designed to meet those complex needs of the population that we just described. Uh, we have a new logo and we appreciate um, Emily Enders, who I mentioned earlier, and also Liz Schrader from United Way helped us in developing our, our new branding. Uh, you can see that there are different uh, representations or symbols in this logo. Uh, the idea of moving upward, the idea of recognizing cycles in the circle, and then unity, bringing people together. So we want to express our appreciation for that. We are the continuum of care now for the Marion and Polk region. Uh, and so want to spend a few minutes talking about what is a continuum of care. So the continuum of care program was developed by the federal government. Uh, it's administered by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, as we call them. Uh, you can see the two overarching purposes of the program on the slide. So the first is around community planning and coordination. And this is with all the programs and all the dollars that are focused on homelessness in our Marion and Polk region. Even though we are not providing services uh, as an alliance, and we have multiple partners and multiple agencies, including City of Salem and Salem Housing Authority that are uh, delivering a lot of those services. We want to make sure that we're all growing in the same direction. And so that's the first purpose of the continuum of care. The second is to submit that single community application for federal dollars. It's not a large pot of money. Uh, it's a larger pot of money in Lane County. And I think I showed you those numbers a couple of years ago, about four times as much in Lane County as we get in Marion and Polk. Uh, they've been working at this a long time. Uh, we just started working on it again as a, a continuum of care for Marion and Polk last February, February 2020. So we can build that over time uh, in that single application. And we were just beginning to think that we were going to do that federal application uh, last summer. And then COVID hit and uh, we got a waiver from doing it. So all of the programs that we're funding right now are just carried over from the prior uh, uh, continuum of care, which I'll describe in this slide. So the continuum of care program has been around since about 1994. Uh, between 1994 and 2011, Community Action Agency, Mid Willamette Valley Community Action, was coordinating the effort. And they were doing that with staff support that was not supported at all through the continuum of care program. Uh, in 2011, HUD came out with some significantly uh, more stringent uh, expectations. Uh, one was use of this homeless management information system that Jan talked about. Uh, a second one was that dollars would be allocated by performance of the programs rather than simply by need. There was a need uh, formula that was developed and up until that time, that's how dollars were allocated. So in 2011, uh, the group of agencies that was working together uh, for Mary, representing Marion Polk County decided to join 26 other counties in what was called the Rural Oregon Continuum of Care, or the ROC. Uh, there was a significant lack of governmental participation. I've reviewed the minutes and looked at the partners uh, at that time. And uh, I think Community Action acknowledges that it was just beyond their capacity to meet those higher expectations. Uh, they were welcomed by ROC and told that they would be uh, expanded and uh, supported. And I think that happened the first few years, but then over time, uh, it became more and more just the programs that were being funded from each of those 28 counties uh, meeting together and really not that vision of coordinating and planning throughout the, the community or the region so that we could work together to end, prevent and end homelessness. Um, so in 2016, Marion County, Salem, Polk County, and Kaiser 
worked together to form a task force that met for a year. And one of the recommendations that was put in that task force's strategic plan was that there would be a review of whether or not to remain in this 28 county continuum of care. That analysis occurred in early 2019. Um, many jurisdictions passed resolutions, including Salem, uh, and submitted letters of support that we should recreate the two-county continuum of care for the Marion Polk region. Uh, some organizations formed a development council. Salem was a part of that development council as well and prepared an application to HUD, and the application was approved in December 2019. trying to figure out where I am here. I'm going backwards, that's the problem. All right, there we go. So what does a continuum of care do? Uh, it's a lot of work to improve the system of services to address homelessness. So we're working to try to not only do planning, but we're convening to share information, to share best practices, to collect and analyze data, to evaluate the quality of services. We have a performance and evaluation committee that's really critical to that. Uh, we identify and align resources, and then we're making sure that the region is prepared to submit that annual application for funding. And I will say parenthetically, when we were rushing to try to get that application, uh, prepare ourselves for it dropping, uh, Jan and Carla and I went through line by line the application document that had been put out by HUD the year before. And it took us five hours to just go through line by line through the document. It is a tremendously complex and comprehensive document. And they want us to dot every I and cross every T. If we do that, then we'll be like Clackamas County that got the highest score in the nation on the last uh, NOFA process, which means more dollars as well. So I provided for you, uh, well, I provided for you a PDF of this entire PowerPoint presentation, but also this org chart and the board roster so that you can see uh, how we're structured. Chris actually went over the uh, chair and the vice chair and, uh, and we have a number of committees. You can see on each side, the HMIS work, work, users work group, the coordinated entry committee, point in time count work group, performance and evaluation committee. We have our board and an executive committee, and I'll explain the ORS 190 entity in a minute. But the really the, where the real work happens is the collaborative committee, and that's that gargantuan box in the center. So this was really modeled after the Clackamas County uh, structure that they have for their continuum of care. We figured if they were so successful, why not uh, model ourselves after that success? It's a come one, come all committee. Uh, the board does not appoint members to this committee. Anyone can come. I, we have uh, co-chairs for the committee, Jan and Carla uh, staff that committee. And uh, it is really where the real work of the continuum of care happens. Uh, more than 50 agencies and 100 individuals participate. I think Jan said at the last meeting, you had what, about 47? Was that? <laughs> that just number just stuck in my head uh, at the last collaborative committee meeting. Um, the ORS 190 entity, if I could talk about that for just a second, the uh, alliance is not a legal entity. It's a consortium or a collaboration. Uh, so it had no authority to be able to enter into contracts, prepare a budget, uh, have those legal relationships, accept money from HUD. That was the kind of critical piece. Uh, so it was the decision, the joint decision of the governmental members to form an ORS 190 entity. So out of the board members, there are eight governmental entities. And so that group meets jointly with the Alliance board, the uh, 20 voting members on that board. Um, so far for every meeting uh, to be able to uh, have those legal processes move forward, like opening bank accounts and approving budgets and that type of thing. Uh, I do want to also thank uh, Chris who serves on the board and Mayor Bennett who serves on the board and Kristen Rutherford who backs up uh, Chris and the mayor when they can't be there and also Nicole Utes who is uh, a board member from Salem. So you're very well represented. The way that the charter works also the uh, uh, Salem and Marion County since they are the ones that have contributed 
the most in terms of support for the organization uh, get two votes uh, each on the board uh, as a reflection of that. And I know Mayor Bennett uh, pushed for that very hard. So uh, we've honored that. Next, I wanna to move to the goals. This is in the strategic plan that was uh, adopted by the board in June, 2020. So it has nine goals and seven strategies. Uh, we, uh, in the charter, are asked to review that strategic plan and update it annually. And so June is just around the corner. Actually, we're gonna update it uh, formally in July this year to give us a little bit of extra time. But uh, Jan Calvin is kind of our uh, point person on the strategic plan. She had provided to the uh, board at the last meeting, this was last week, a 66 page document that has every objective underneath each one of these goals. So it's a really hefty document. And in that it's showing what we've accomplished and then what the next steps are for each one of these. So if, I'm not gonna go through each one of the goals because I think that took an hour almost at our board meeting for Jan to do that, but I wanna highlight a couple and then see if you have any questions about them. Um, so you can see that uh, the homeless services system is the first one. And a lot of what we've been working on in our first year is to just stand that system up. But also you'll see that we have affordable housing um, as well as permanent housing as two of our goals. And that is an area where governments can really participate and be part of that through uh, all kinds of things that City of Salem has already been working on through your various codes and incentives and you know ways to try to incentivize and working with your housing authority too to get uh, permanent housing, permanent supportive housing for uh, people who are chronically homeless. And then you can see we also have goals around specific populations, around prevention, uh, health and safety, uh, and then sheltering, uh, as well as transitional housing. Are there any questions on the goals before we move into the strategies? So I'm just gonna hit this at a real high level and uh, then we're gonna move into the strategies, yes. Sorry, Janet, I, on the sort of your large group in the middle, which had all the providers on it uh, and your homeless, yeah, the collaboration committee. And, and then uh, if you go back up, I, I have to catch the, terminology you're using on your first goal, if you go forward again. And your homeless services system, do you find a lot of duplication of services or is it a pretty efficient system out there right now? Or is it, is it, just, needs, it just needs lots of hands so we can't get too many involved or are we? we you know, I, the, there are a couple areas that we focused on, and I think Jan needs to chime in on this too, since she staffs that collaborative committee. Uh, one of the things that HUD requires is that uh, as many organizations as possible put their data into that homeless management information system, because as Jan explained, the point in time count is really subject to you know all kinds of variables that make it so it's not that accurate. But if we're assessing people year round, and putting that information into the database, we have much better data. Because the pot of money grew so small under the 28 county rock, we only fund three programs in Marion and Polk County. So those three programs are required to put the information in because they get HUD funding, uh, continuum of care funding. But a lot of organizations, if they don't get HUD funding, say, well, why should we participate in this database? It's extra work for us and so on. So a lot of what Jan has been working on uh, through the, and the members of the HMIS uh, users work group is to try to encourage more organizations to put data in that database. Uh, you'll see in our accomplishments that went from, it says 25%, Jan said 23% I heard in the last presentation, but anyway, under 25%, we're at 75% now, and we just got oh, a five and a half million dollar grant and we'll be, I think, at 82% then. So, that, so that's one example of trying to get the system to work together. They've done a universal release of information form, so everybody gets those agreements and it's uh, aligned so that it looks the same and everybody's doing it the same way. We're trying to get as many organizations as possible to do coordinated entry, so there's kind of no wrong door. And when people, no matter where people go, they can get their assessment. They don't get sent to Arches and then sent back somewhere else. Um, so I don't know that it's as much, I mean, if you say duplication, we, we could have 
so many more services and still yeah. not have enough for everybody. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. You're the ones that are working so hard on that. Uh, and at the same time, I think if we do the types of things that I just described, we're going to be able to expand the capacity, make our services more efficient, more effective uh, that we already have, as well as trying to build on that. Great. So, Jen, add, add what I missed there, if you would. Well, as I understand your question, Mayor Bennett, it, it, it's really looking at if there's so many people out there doing all this great work, is there overlap in their work? And the the answer that Janet gave is the first answer I would, would echo is that we still have a lot of homeless people and everybody is full up and busy. So we need a greater capacity, whether or not we need more agencies or we need to expand the work of individual agencies is, is another question. And kind of your philosophical approach perhaps um, would, would come into question. So we can have a transitional housing unit that might really focus on uh, males who are released from prison, right? And so working with that population is gonna be different than a transitional housing for families. Right. So because there's so many populations, there's a lot of room at the table to serve them well by honing in on their unique needs. Um, so much of the work or the success of, of the work is when uh, agencies can do dedicated case management, not simply house somebody because housing doesn't end homelessness. Okay. Who's your primary mental health agency in this? Well, in looking at that, there are people who um, specialize in mental health but do not have housing. So mental health is considered an augment or a it's a critical need, but we don't have mental health housing. Okay, thank you. But I would add that I think the two primary uh, organizations that need to be at the table to work with us on this would be the the two county health and health departments or health and human services departments for Marion and Polk County because they provide I think the lion's share and then also the Willamette Health Council uh, through the continuum of care. Now folks who are homeless are signed up for Medicaid which is not necessarily a given. I know that a lot of the work that our outreach people do is to try to get people the benefits that they aren't signed up for. But once they are signed up for that Medicaid system, uh, there is a, a vast array of mental health services, very high quality mental health services that they would be uh, eligible for. Thank you. I had a question. Hi, uh, thank you, Ms. Carlson, Ms. Calvin. This is absolutely fascinating. And I'm so happy that you're here because uh, this is the sort of information that is out there, but a lot of folks don't know about it. So I've been very impressed thus far with your presentation. Um, and I really want to say, I appreciate you point out the fact that homelessness affects rural Oregon too. I think a lot of people just don't realize that, but there is absolutely a uh, a problem with homelessness throughout the state of Oregon, uh, which has been the, what I have heard from people all over. My question is about uh, how do you define chronically homeless? I was intrigued when you said that nearly half of the Mary and Polk homeless are chronically homeless. How do you define chronically? Does that mean over a year, over five years? Is it a squishy definition? Oh, I, will, I will take that one first. Yes. It's not a squishy definition at all. HUD um, has a, about a half page definition of it, which I'm not gonna pull out right now in sight, but to give you the idea, there's four different ways to qualify as chronically homeless. And part of it has to do with the duration, how long at a given time, but also cumulative months over a three year period. So multiple times going in and out of stability. Um, and then also they look at uh, that to be chronically homeless, there also has to be a disability. And the disability can be um, a chronic disability or it can be an episodic disability. So substance abuse is one of our most frequent disabilities that qualifies somebody for being chronically homeless, but it's not alone that sort of uh, an issue. It is along with time on the streets. 
this uh, it certainly begs the question for me if our I would be curious I don't know if your presentation will go into this or whether we can chat another time but I would really love to understand for the 49% of our homeless who identify as chronically homeless I would be very curious to know for example is it a lack of access to drug treatment is it a lack of access to mental health services what other disabilities are what set these individuals mm -hmm. apart and um, yeah, so I don't know. Will you be covering that in more detail tonight? We probably weren't going, you know, we were trying to keep this sort of like, we have a lot of different things to talk about, but we can send you that definition. And Jan, uh, and uh, I know Jimmy Jones also has, and Ashley, I mean, uh, Breezy have a lot of information on it. Sure, so, let's keep things on track. That's fine. All right. Thank you. All right, so let's move into the strategies. Uh, and I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time on each strategy, but this is to just give you a sense about uh, what our strategies were uh, overarching and then where we're at with each of them. So the first one is to engage a full array of stakeholders, uh, as you can read there. Uh, I already mentioned the work of the collaborative committee where this engagement occurs on a monthly basis. We convened our first annual summit in February of this year. We had 109 people on Zoom from 63 organizations. So you can see there's a lot of interest from the uh, provider community and some were community members that came to that uh, summit. And then we have 10 providers that came together to submit a collaborative grant application to Oregon Housing and Community Services. And that was the five and a half million dollar grant that we were just awarded uh, and we're still waiting for the contract on. The second strategy is to prioritize chronically homeless individuals and youth. And you just heard the discussion about chronically homeless and why that's so important. We have those significant numbers and these are the people that are most difficult to house. And we've certainly prioritized that population in our plan. Uh, we've also prioritized youth. There are just very few services for homeless youth in our region. And that's been true for a very long time. But we recognize there are other populations with important needs and we'll continue to include those populations in planning and service delivery. The third strategy is addressing racial and ethnic equity. Uh, HUD requires continuums of care to analyze data related, related to equity and service delivery. Uh, we kind of took this to the next level. We were fortunate to be awarded a PACE team. This is a program at Willamette University's Atkinson School of Management where you get a team of MBA students and they're with you for a school year. Uh, this study that they did included interviews with key community leaders, a survey of service providers, and data analysis. And we just received the final report. We had a, just a few minutes after the team presented it uh, last month, and we were going to uh, have follow-up discussion, but uh, ended up moving that to our next meeting. But if any of you would like us to forward the paper and the PowerPoint presentation that the team did so that you could see uh, the types of strategies that they're recommending, what we'd be happy to do that. Was, I would uh, like that. I would like that, Janet. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and send that uh, to to all of you then, so that you can see that uh, it was just it was a tremendously inspiring process for me. I got to be their champion throughout the year and uh, work with them on editing documents and sending them research materials and uh, informing them about you know what the alliance was doing and who the folks were in our community. Uh, but they just did a fantastic job. Uh, our strategy number four is to expand community awareness. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. One of the reasons that I began with the idea about who is homeless is because there's so much misinformation out there and so many stereotypes and so much stigma around being homeless. Um, we are starting to work with local media. We're a, we're a very small operation. and We have a very limited budget in terms of, uh, of the staffing that we have, but thanks to City of Salem, we do have some of Emily's time to help us with that. Capital Community Media has approached us and has some interest in doing uh, some, vet, some vignettes on homelessness. Uh, let's see if there's anything else to add on that. So move to number five, which is using proven approaches, the voices of lived experience and analysis of local data to make informed decisions. To end and prevent homelessness, we need to use approaches that have been proven to get results. Uh, one example of this is the Built for Zero. It's a national initiative that the Alliance joined several months before we were officially a continuum of care. Kaiser Permanente paid the $10,000 joining fee for us. 
Uh, we get a coach for technical assistance and a data template to build the system. The last quarterly report I looked at, I think we're like within one task to be actually there. Uh, and there are communities around the nation that are involved in this that have brought their both their veterans and their chronic homeless populations to what they call functional zero, which means that they're housing people uh, as they come in. So it doesn't say that new people won't come in the system, but you're able to uh, find permanent housing solutions for the people as they come in. Uh, representatives uh, meet several times a month to do case conferencing and they strategize together about how to permanently house people on the list. Six and seven, uh, expanding house, shelter and housing capacity and leveraging resources. We know that to end homelessness, we need housing units for people and there's a severe shortage of affordable housing in our region. While people are waiting for housing, shelter is critical. We have Union Gospel Mission that's expanding, other shelters and transitional housing providers that are actively working with the Alliance. We're also encouraged by the work of the three housing authorities in working with landlords to locate new units for people in need. And also the city of Salem for constructing projects like Redwood Crossings. We hear about that, Sequoia Crossings, Sequoia Hall. So you're doing just a yeoman's task in getting those uh, uh, facilities up and running. So by implementing the strategic plan step-by-step, step, we believe that ending homeless is possible. Uh, one of the premises of being part of Built for Zero is that there's a belief that homelessness, ending homelessness is possible. And I have to say that it can seem really discouraging uh, when you look at numbers and you are in the community and you see the numbers of people on the streets. But I think we have to go with that belief system in order to be determined uh, to move forward on the strategies that we have. And again, I think the importance of governmental participation, it's so huge in uh, reaching the goals that we have. So I wanna spend just a few minutes on what we've accomplished uh, since we were since we last uh, visited with you in 2019. Uh, we developed a long list of accomplishments for part of the recent budget document. I provided that to you uh, with the documents that you got in advance with the agenda. And this, these are just a few highlights from that list. So in 2019, uh, I mentioned Kaiser Permanente contributing the $10,000 joining fee and we began uh, with Built for Zero. We had a development council that submitted that application to HUD. Uh, five days later, we were approved as the Salem Marion Pope Continuum of Care. Uh, in 2020, uh, we received from the Community Business and Education Leaders Collaborative, or CBEL, as I'm sure you've uh, heard of, uh, a $150,000 grant over three years funded by Mountain West Investment Corporation to support the continuum of care. We held our first board meeting on February 13th, ratified a charter, elected leaders, appointed committee members, and approved an interim intergovernmental agreement, which I must say Dan Atchison was just... Uh, pivotal in making that happen and we're so appreciative of the work that he did. Uh, in June we had a strategic plan to approve uh, and in July we actually uh, also had a regional gap analysis that uh, supplemented that strategic plan and we began putting together the local application materials for HUD's NOFA which I mentioned then didn't happen, but <laughs> uh, probably was best for us that it didn't happen that first year because we had so much on our plate. By August, we'd formed the ORS 190 entity. So we had a legal entity and it's serving as the collaborative applicant. Also in August, the collaborative committee endorsed that universal release of information form that I mentioned. In September, the PACE team joined us and began their study. In November, the challenge to end youth homelessness, which was a separate group that was uh, receiving some staff support from us, officially joined the Alliance as a subcommittee. Um, in December, the Performance and Evaluation Committee developed a process to monitor and evaluate funded projects and started doing those monitoring visits. Um, also in December, the board approved new HMIS agency participation and user agreements, which uh, Jan and others have been busily working to try to get people signed up uh, on those. Uh, and then in January, the report was, and I mentioned the statistic before, an increase from 25% to 75% of the region's housing and homeless service providers actually participating in HMIS. Uh, in late January, we had that week long, well, actually a couple of weeks long annual point in time count. Uh, Carla Munz was uh, very uh, actively involved in coordinating that. 
uh, along with Community Action Agency, which is the agency that's responsible for doing that point in time count. Uh, in February, we had our first annual summit. In March, uh, Oregon Housing and Community Services announced its intent to award the five and a half million dollar uh, emergency solutions, solutions grant for COVID, which again has 10 providers uh, and is gonna expand our street outreach, uh, rapid rehousing and a whole lot of other services in our region. And we're just really excited for that uh, grant and thankful to Jan Calvin and the, the team that put that together. So during the collaborative committee in January, the uh, committee members uh, were asked the questions that you see on the slide about the continuum of care's first year. So when they discussed what was better after a year working with the Alliance, they pointed to several things. Under the system development, they noted networking opportunities through committees and virtual meetings reducing travel. Under practice, they talked about improvements through using coordinated entry and also the alignment uh, to address the wildfire evacuee needs. Under client benefits, they noticed that it, they noted that improved relationships among the agencies have prevented returns to homelessness or people moving into homelessness. And under capacity building, they said they have seen more collaboration among agencies and more sharing of resources. So again, we thank the city of Salem for being part of the Alliance. Uh, we have just a few ways across the bottom of this slide that you can tell your constituents that they can help. Uh, we uh, encourage contributions to our member partners. Uh, volunteers are definitely needed. Uh, people can join committees if they're interested in doing that, and they can help us by informing others um, through that public education that we talked about. We want to acknowledge the excellent leadership uh, by our Alliance Chair, Mayor Kathy Clark from Kaiser and Vice Chair, Salem Council President Chris Hoy. Uh, Mayor Clark is also the president of the ORS 190 entity and, and Chris Hoy is the vice president. So they serve in dual roles there. If you need any information, you can contact them or you can contact one of the staff team and you can see our emails on this final slide. So, take this down. Well, great job, Jan. That uh, really was good. I tell you, uh, seeing that again, uh, everything put together, uh, it so uh, fulfills the expectations I, I, we had about five or six years ago when we began to travel down this road uh, to get our own COC, to get out of the, the rock and really uh, begin building capacity in our area. I, I it's really impressive to see what you accomplished. And I can't tell you how uh, uh, pleased I think we all are with the work that Chris Hoy has done on this. Uh, he comes to, he came to us as one of the leaders of the Clackamas County uh, Continuum of Care. And it just struck me, we were so fortunate to have him uh, arrive on the council at a time when it really was important we had uh, people with the kind of expertise he brought, and then just the energy of Kathy Clark. And then, of course, uh, you and Jan Calvin are like two very special people. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was just an excellent presentation. You can really see the future in this. It's, it's neat to see it uh, being accomplished. So thank you very much. Uh, Vanessa? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I had a question. Uh, I think and thank you also uh, for all your efforts on this. It's sincerely appreciated. Uh, American Recovery Plan funds. A number of the organizations who are members of your Homeless Alliance are all going to be receiving American Recovery Plan dollars. I'm curious, is the Alliance talking about how multiple jurisdictions at the county and city level might pool a portion of those resources to work together, for example, to say, we at city council are constantly getting emails saying, I see a vacant building over there. I see a vacant warehouse over there. Why don't you buy it? And that's oftentimes outside of the city of Salem's price point and our availability of funds. But we, all the cities, all the big cities and all the counties are getting federal money that they have to spend by December 31, 2024. And I'm wondering if the Homeless Alliance, as an extraordinary opportunity to work together, 
is discussing the possibility of multiple cities and counties pooling a portion of the money that they're going to be getting from the feds to pool their resources to perhaps purchase a building or make a real dent in, say, mental health or drug treatment services. Jan, you want to? Yeah, sure. You know, I think every time there's a new opportunity of, of revenue um, is tremendous, it's needed. And individually, people uh, either have a plan at the ready to move forward to expand their capacity and they're thinking as typical about what their agency can do. What the Alliance has not done yet is created a forum to talk specifically about these dollars. But what I think has happened is greater collaboration between different agencies already so that when they're thinking about what they can do, they're not only thinking about their own agency. Um, so I think the door is open and things are primed. I think you've got an excellent idea. And I know that uh, Kristen Rutherford has, has talked about, you know, from the city standpoint, um, how does it apply to the geography that you're accountable to, um, which can help us think about how do we go further than that. We have been talking to a couple, or I've heard from a couple of, of organizations that are trying to figure out what they can do with those dollars that is sustainable. Right? So, so once you start a, a program in response, hopefully you're working yourself out of job so you won't need those dollars in the future because we want to end homelessness, not simply manage it. Um, so I know that uh, people would be interested in having that sort of conversation and we haven't planned a forum as such yet. And if I could just add to that really quickly, um, we're just barely over a year old. I, we have accomplished a lot at the same time I would say that the different governmental jurisdictions are in many ways at very different places in terms of their perspectives and uh, moving forward. City of Salem has, as I mentioned, you've done so many things. Uh, we get reports at the beginning of each meeting and independence that would, uh, Shannon Core, who's our representative, just reported that their, her community needs to actually believe a shelter is necessary before they might be able to, uh, to move forward with that. Uh, Marion County is very focused on the San Yam Canyon and helping people that have been uh, victims of that wild, those wildfires up there. Um, so while I think it's a great idea, I think one of the things that has to happen is that the governmental jurisdictions have to kind of have the same perspective in order to agree <laughs> that these are the types of things that they want to do. So I'm not saying that that can't be done, but that's one of the, the things that we would have to work on. But I do think it's a great idea. And if I could just follow up on that. And that's exactly one of the reasons that we're doing this tour. Uh, Jan and I presented to the city of Dallas recently, uh, and we're going, and we're also going around to all of our uh, all of our member entities to bring all of you guys up to speed and all of our counterparts on in the other cities and jurisdictions, because I know intimately what's going on with the alliance. But now you guys are all starting to learn, and we really need to build up the sort of the, the broader knowledge base of the Alliance's work to build exactly the momentum that Janet's talking about to get to where you're suggesting, Vanessa, because we, we're really on kind of an, a, an internal outreach right now to the governmental entities, and then we plan to go outward to the public. And so it's kind of a, uh, it's a rollout and timing sometimes is everything. And we're, you know, we, we might not, we might be a year away from something like what you're suggesting, but we might be able to do some really great groundwork in the meantime. Uh, Jim Lewis. Yeah, I, I too want to appreciate all the work that you folks have been been putting into this. Uh, the one thing that really stands out is the goal to be organized. The more organized you are, the more successful you can be. And I especially appreciate the mission um, to end and prevent homelessness as opposed to managing it. So I think that's great. My question is, and the one I'm going to get, and, and, and you're going to hear it more and more, is how long is it going to get, how long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? So I was just listening to Jimmy Jones on uh, the, uh, with uh, the podcast, I'm trying to think I'm losing names in my head right now. Melanie Zermer. All right. Uh, with KMUZ. And uh, I'm sure he talks to you often. He talks to us often too. He's on the board. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get into the situation that we're in. It's going to take a long time to get out of the situation we're in. 
But again, if we don't believe that we can solve the problem and we don't make those efforts, we're never going to get there. Uh, so it's not, I think people need to be patient. Uh, I think Jimmy has also impressed on us that part of the reason we got into the situation is because we tended to focus on trying to take the easiest to house with the resources that we had and work with those instead of focusing on the most difficult to house. If we're going to switch that paradigm and focus on the most difficult to house, which are the chronically homeless, um, it's going to be a methodical process that's going to, again, take time. And then the other piece is, I continually hear, and I'm sure you hear this too, and Nicole probably talks about this, uh, there are, even if we get a lot more vouchers, we need to have places for people to live where the rents are within the income standard within those vouchers. And so being able to expand that supply of affordable housing, I mean, it's just key to being able to resolve the many complex issues that we've talked about tonight. Jan, anything you wanna add? Well, there's one thing to note, and we're, we're waiting for the data um, from the statewide youth homelessness assessment that is going on. They have uh, contracted with an outfit to do a, and they're in the middle of a methodology that will create, for lack of a better word, a, a blueprint. They were actually documenting current need, doing projection analysis, and then saying, based on the needs that we understand from the youth, this is what it would cost to meet their needs, which I think is, I mean, it seems like a simple thing, but I think it's phenomenal that we would actually get this data and say, well, how do we go about doing that then? It's um, a plan for a plan. Um, so we're very excited that the, the state has invested in doing that. Virginia? Yeah, I was just curious what you all would need uh, to be able to take this alliance and kind of take it to the next level. What would that take? Well, I, I tend to be a systems person. So in thinking about that, uh, you know, my dream is that you would have a really well-honed, well-skilled um, staff team to support the work of all the doers in the world. Um, right now, as Janet said, the three of us are contracting and it's maybe a, a full-time equivalency as far as our, our, our hours. You got one staff position trying to pull this all together. Now, granted, there's lots of other partners doing great work, um, and Community Action has dedicated a couple of staff that do the HMIS and coordinated entry work on the behalf of the full continuum. But that's not going to be enough. So Chris Hoy pitched an idea at the, at the uh, summit, which we still have to put on the agenda to have more discussion about. And I think Gretchen Bennett and Steve Powers were perhaps involved in some of the uh, genesis of the idea, but to have a sustainable funding source, uh, I liken it to having like a, you know, like a library district or the 4-H district or whatever. So, I mean, there would be a lot of steps that you have to go through in order to get that. Uh, because right now we're heavily reliant on the contributions of the member organizations. And the reason that Salem gets two votes and Marion County gets two votes is because they are the largest contributors to helping stand this organization up. Uh, we're getting our first planning grant sometime in the near future. We think maybe within the next three to four months, that's going to be $28,000 a year. You can't run an organization on $28,000 a year. So uh, I think I would agree with Jan that to have that sustainable income source and then be able to have the staff team that could support the work uh, beyond what we're doing. And, and we're all working really hard. And I do have to tell you, that uh, we're on flat rate contracts, which means that we have so many hours a month that we get paid for. And if we work beyond that, we don't get paid for that. And we could, we actually have kept statistics. We've worked well beyond the number of hours that we're paid for because it's a labor of love for us, but um, it's, it's not sustainable for this organization to have that staffing model. And if I could just follow up on that just for a moment, uh, Jan or Janet and Jan are both being quite modest. Uh, they, they volunteer, and I, it's volunteer, they volunteer so many hours to this organization. We do pay them a, a, an amount, but it doesn't come anywhere near covering the value they bring to the organization. We really have to figure out a way to, to increase that and to actually have, uh, like, like Janet said, a, a sustained uh, income or 
a higher mm -hmm. level of contribution from more right. folks or something. We, we, we need more money to run the organization to really take it to that next level. I think that was a great question, Virginia. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to second that. We get two votes because we put up a lot of money to get this going. And we also were trying to sort of shame our our colleagues in <laughs> all those other governments. Uh, you notice Kaiser doesn't have two votes. Uh, uh, a lot of people are shortchanging this project and resting on uh, other people's work. This is one that really demands all hands on deck. The other governments around us, I don't think have stepped up yet. We'll continue, but I think these guys are creating a program that will attract them, uh, hopefully. But the good news is they're at, they're at the table, though, Mr. Mayor. They're at the table. Those no, folks. they're at the table. They're at the table. <laughs> they're not paying for the food. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they should pick up the tab anyway. Once point. in a while, pick up the tab. Yeah. yeah. A, a, a couple uh, points. Um, uh, first of all, thanks. This is terrific. Uh, we really appreciate all you're doing uh, on behalf of the less fortunate people in our society. Um, and I think potentially this roadshow that, you know, Chris and somebody else was on, I think it was you, Jan, is helpful maybe to get some more contributions. But my question is, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, we can't do this alone. It has to be spread out. And in particularly, and this is also kind of an area of misinformation. We've got a lot of folks on the ODOT properties in Salem up and down I-5. And as far as the average citizen is concerned, it's our property. It's not ODOT's property. We're the people who are letting this happen on Market Street, that sort of stuff. So I'm just wondering, are we getting any kind of cooperation uh, uh, with the state from the state as a whole and specifically from ODOT? So I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I know I read recently that there was a meeting with the governor about that. And Chris, were you involved in that meeting? I, yes, the mayor and the city manager and I, along with the CEO of Fred Meyer and some other folks met with the governor last Thursday to talk about that very topic. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. It's one of those, uh, we're working on it still, Trevor. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. It's really helpful um, to get this high level overview. Um, you know, the, but I agree with the question that Councillor Stapleton asked. I think that's, that's paramount. I might be phrasing that question in a slightly different way, um, but I heard a reference to how Lane County gets more funding possibly from the federal level and Clackamas is like got the perfect score on their, their test question. So where are we at like in comparison to them and, and what do you need from us to, to be more like them or to be more successful? And I guess third way to phrase it, is there an opportunity cost in not having those FTEs at this time? So let me just say, first of all, that uh, if when we were part of the Rock, our score was below the median score. So we were mediocre at best, I guess I don't want to you know there were there are a lot of reasons for that they had less than one staff person that was serving 28 counties so i mean uh and i know that they were trying as hard as they could uh we have not had the opportunity to strut our stuff yet and uh we kind of went into this thinking that we would just ace it at the beginning the more i get into it the more i realize there's just so many dimensions to this uh there are areas that were just putting our toe in the water, I'll give you one, uh, and that is children aging out of, out of foster care. Uh, there's a whole section on that that you get points on. We've uh, just approved uh, supporting uh, an initiative that's working on that, but, but we aren't heavily engaged in that. So I'm not sure, I, we have to do one first in order to kind of get a baseline and see how well we do. We're doing everything possible to try to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So we have a, a fairly decent score on that. Clackamas County has been doing this for a long time. As I mentioned, Lane County has been doing it for a long time. Frankly, and I have nothing to lose in this because I'm retired. And if you were to fire me tomorrow, I would just say, okay, fine. I'll just you know, be retired in Boise. That's great. So I'll just be very frank with you. I think that in order for us to do well on this first NOFA, we need to keep this consultant team that has developed the expertise and the relationships. I think if you were to move to a different staffing model before you did that first NOFA, it actually would be detrimental to the application itself. Um, I think the having that staff uh, model that we talked about is probably uh, 
a year or so out, maybe even two years out as we try to get that sustainable source of revenue uh, moving. But uh, anyway, that's my, my editorial comment. Yeah, it's a, and that's a really good one. It, it, you can look back in history and you'll find out it, when, they, when they decided locally here, whoever was the leadership in our community at that time, to go with 28 other counties, primarily out in Eastern Oregon and downstate, they made a, a strategic mistake. Uh, Lane County and Clackamas County did not make that mistake. And time, uh, time is important. Uh, it's sort of like if you look back on, on previous councils that didn't raise the water rates and let the water system uh, lag at, at various times, or you know, it's that kind of problem. So we're building an infrastructure here is what this is. And uh, you really start from the ground up. Uh, uh, and that staff issue is a huge issue. I, I really agree completely with Janet on that one. And Councilor Nordyke. I appreciate your question, and I think it was two-part um, as far as the, the opportunity cost. And what happens within the NOFA is you really, in my mind, it's two applications. One, it says, this is how great we're doing planning and pulling people together and advancing and really studying our issues and looking at equity and looking at systems like foster care, X, Y, Z, right? This is how we're bringing people together who are answering the call. And you get points for that. And then there's the, here's what we want to do with some money that we'd like you to bring to our community. The two are intertwined, but the amount of money right now is around a million dollars. We just got a $5.5 million grant from a different source. So in the context of all the work, the CDBG money, the, all the revenues, the people in their own nonprofits who are leveraging dollars, uh, United Way, if you were to put all that money together, the money that comes out of the HUD COC program, if we make it to 5 million at some point and be closer to Lane, that's going to be great. But it's only going to be a small slice of what's needed to address the entire issue and how we continue to bring folks together. Right. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Phillips, there was an article in the Statesman Journal in December of 2019 that said that Lane County received more than three million from the federal government to fight homelessness and Marion Polk got less than $700,000 combined. Just to help show, that's just a, an example of the difference that can make from having a proper continuum of care for your own county. So. And neither was enough for either county to do much of anything. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yeah, I, um, everybody's got an opinion, so I'll give you mine. Um, I, I understand about the need for money. Um, I, I hear we need to be patient. Uh, right now, currently, for a number of years, homelessness is the number one issue of the uh, citizens of Salem. I, I think we need to take advantage of that concern and ask the citizens to help financially. In 2008, uh, during the greatest recession that any of us have ever seen, Citizens of Salem stepped up and passed a bond of almost almost $100 million. If, if the issue truly is the main issue, I believe the goodness of this citizenship would step up, but, but they need to be asked. And I encourage you to think about asking us. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Just a great job. That was really... Uh, it, I think it gives us a picture of where we're going and, and why we're doing what we're doing and that uh, we're on a, we're on the, at least the track and be picking up some new things along the way. Okay. I want to um, acknowledge uh, Gretchen Bennett and your decision to, uh, to have a point person. And, and I also think you couldn't have picked a better one. So thank you. for We think that too. We do. We do. Do you want to say thank you, Gretchen? Or would you? <laughs> I do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay. Okay, uh, Steve, would you like to take us to our next uh, portion here? Yes. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for uh, uh, reading my script regarding why why Janet and Jan went first, because I, I think they did a great job of of summarizing the really tough work uh, that they've helped initiate to and homelessness. And, and while that slow regional work 
uh, continues and I think is, as, as was discussed, is really gaining momentum. Uh, we here, as you all know very well, here at the city level do have a sheltering crisis and have an ongoing and immediate need to uh, continue to try to manage homelessness, manage those neighbors of ours who need shelter. Uh, to help you with that issue, uh, there are a couple of, of pieces of information in the packet that I'd like to draw to your attention. And then with staff's help, uh, including Gretchen, our, our less than uh, full-time homeless coordinator, uh, we'll, we'll walk through those uh, documents as long as your uh, patience and, and, and interest uh, uh, continue this evening. Uh, the first is a draft declaration uh, that would end the sheltering in the two parks, Cascade Gateway and Wallace Marine. And, and Gretchen and Dan Atchison can, can discuss that with you. The second piece is a summary that Gretchen authored regarding our uh, ongoing efforts to add shelter capacity, as well as uh, I think also well highlighted by Janet, you know, the one of the difficulties we have is, is quantifying the numbers of, of individuals who need help. Uh, Gretchen, with the assistance of our, of, of other staff have attempted to do that for you, including uh, ODOT properties. And then the last is a real draft. And there's a lot in that last uh, document, the draft code concepts. And again, that's where you're your patience will be our indicator of whether to stop uh, as, as we introduce that uh, last document or whether you wanna keep going because we can certainly come back to you and we'll need to come back to you at a later time because there is a lot of information that our community development staff, Lisa Anderson Ogilvy and Bryce Bishop have, have drafted for you uh, that would allow the siting of shelters as at least COVID emergency appears to be at the beginning of the end, and perhaps our state's uh, housing crisis may also start to improve. Uh, we do have uh, draft code uh, language for you regarding the siting of shelters. Uh, so I would, I would suggest, uh, Mayor, uh, Council, uh, it's up to you, but I would suggest that we take a few minutes to review for you the uh, the draft declaration, because unfortunately that would be something unless the sense of council is to go a different direction, uh, that would be something that I would be, be bringing back to you at your next meeting. And, and that's uh, the resolution, Mr. Powers, the resolution number 2021-21, is that the document you're? Correct. Okay, thank you. And, and the, other, the other pieces of information for you, including the sheltering uh, update, uh, are, are less uh, time sensitive, uh, at least in regards to a specific council action. Uh, Gretchen will be sharing with you some shelter updates that uh, we're happy to uh, report are, are moving along a, a very, very quickly. But in terms of a council decision, uh, the one that's gonna be coming to you next will be consideration of that, of that draft resolution. So I would suggest uh, we start there if, if that's all right. And then with with Gretchen, you or Dan, if you don't mind summarizing that for, for council. Uh, thank you, Steve. So the resolution extends the emergency declaration related to COVID-19. It'll extend it uh, to December 13th, 2021. Um, the reason for the extension is to allow the city's emergency actions related to the pandemic to continue and to allow the city to access federal and state COVID related aid. The declaration does not extend the allowance for camping at Cascades Gateway and Wallace Marine Park. Uh, does it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. My apologies. No, no. I, I, I'm just going to ask a question. Sorry. Good, please do. Okay. Well, Dan, uh, in reading this over, it, it says you can't camp in the parks. Is it a, it's a total ban on camping in the parks? So um, the city code doesn't allow overnight use of the parks. Okay. Um, erecting a, a tent in the camp or in a, in a park has never been um, 
illegal necessarily. It's the overnight stay uh, that has been that has been long been prohibited under the city's code, and that was waived under the previous emergency declaration. But you also have uh, in section four. I don't know. Sub C, I guess it's the you're you're also saying we're going to continue our ban on camping on sidewalks, right? Right. Do I understand that? The, the there's a restriction on public gatherings on sidewalks to mitigate the spread of COVID. Publicly owned sidewalks, including landscape strips, are limited to active pedestrian use. That sounds like a ban on camping to me. Am I reading it wrong? Uh, probably. So okay. the previously, what council adopted as part of the emergency declaration was a pro prohibition on public gatherings. Um, in the last iteration of the emergency declaration, we amended that slightly to state that if people are masked and maintain six foot separation, they can still gather. That restriction remains in place. Uh, Dan, I don't know how you read that. Would you take me through that and explain how that doesn't, that says this is for active pedestrian use. Is that a sit lie or part of a sit lie ordinance? What is that? So th that statement in the, uh, in the draft emergency declaration doesn't, does not pro prohibit camping. It's as easy as, as plainly as I can say it. Um, there are areas within the sidewalk that have to be maintained for active pedestrian use that doesn't necessarily prohibit someone from erecting a tent as long as they're uh, observing the other social distancing and mask rules. So, so the effect of this resolution, I'm just trying to get to what the effect of this is, we'll close down camping in the parks, but uh, we'll continue. In fact, we'll see an expansion of it as they move on to our sidewalks downtown. Is that that may saying? be a consequence of, of moving folks out of the parks. This, okay. this resolution does not change the previous restrictions on the sidewalk. Okay. It maintains what was in the declaration previously. Okay. So why are we doing this? Take me down this road again. Um, Tom? The, the COVID-related emergency declaration expires on June 1st. We need it to continue to continue our other emergency actions, such as the uh, allowance of uh, uh, restaurant areas uh, within the parking areas and other, and other options that we've made available uh, related to COVID relief. Okay. So that's why we're extending the emergency declaration. Hmm. Tom? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I haven't had a chance to read it other than what we're talking about here tonight, but I will tell you that um, I and uh, other counselors I know um, have been pretty straightforward with the city folks in our neighborhood groups that we are not going to allow the continued uh, 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 extend the emergency operation has deals with camping or overnight stays in the park. So uh, I'm happy to hear that because I think that's something that we have been saying to the members of the public, particularly about Cascade Gateway, uh, but also about Wallace Marine. So I'm glad to see that that part of the resolution uh, is, is what's happening. And I, I, I'll, I will know by Monday how I feel about the other issues, but I certainly do feel that way about the, the camping and the parks ban. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and in my, in my conversations with uh, the city manager, my position has been, we need reasonable alternatives uh, available when that camping in the parks ends. So they have a, a viable, appropriate alternative you know, the only time I think they're going to end up on the sidewalks is if they don't have a better place to go and we need to be providing a better place to go. Now, does that mean we're going to have a one for one option for people uh, by the time it's uh, we get there? Probably not. But we need to have some healthy steps made towards having a viable alternative for folks. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, from Ms. Bennett here in a little bit. But as to where we're at with that, I don't know exactly where we are. But my position is we need a good place for people to go other than their <coughs> where they're at now. So, do you yeah. think council will need to coerce them off the sidewalks downtown? That has been a very popular way to resolve this issue is is in that sort of north 
North Downtown, Liberty Street, the Marion Parkade. Uh, I mean, we're going to go to them and say, we've got an alternative. You're going to move there. Or how will that, how do you think that'll play out? Do you have any feel for that? Well, I wouldn't use the word coerced by any means, but well. I believe that people <laughs> given a, the, an option for a better, for a better place will generally people will take it. And I love I your optimism. Yeah. Well, we have staff and we have nonprofits who are very skilled at using motivational interviewing and other techniques to try to engage folks and get them in, uh, to take our take services that they may not have been aware or may not actually have been available to them before. Sure. Councillor Lewis. Yeah, just a comment, um, because the, the process of, of moving folks from the parks has already started uh, in Wallace Marine Park. There's been a a, a large difference. I'm not exactly sure where they've gone, but coincidentally, at the same time, I am starting to see more people on the sidewalks downtown. And if I understand the city attorney, as long as they are six feet apart, um, which allows families to be together, but as long as everybody is six feet apart, then then the sidewalks in downtown are open for them to be. And for me, that's going backwards. Um, so until we can take a step forward, I, I, don't, I don't think we should step anywhere. <laughs> what else have I got? Councilor uh, Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I certainly have the same feelings that Councilor Hoy expressed, and uh, I and other councilors have expressed this to the manager and others, but there's something behind that uh, is, is we got a court decision from the Ninth Circuit that says, we can't move them off the streets or move them out of the parks unless we have an alternative for them. So I think that's the whole idea that the city manager and Ms. Bennett and everybody else have been working on. That's the second uh, 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 prong of the let's get them out of the parks by giving them someplace else to go. Uh, and we've got to, not just for moral and other reasons but for legal reasons we're you know we we would be unconstitutional if if we just kicked them out of the park or sort of semi-criminalize this and not give them any other place to go and that's also true about downtown yeah well we'll give them downtown for a while what else we got virginia were you up it's your ward <laughs> yeah i had a question about um in our meetings um mr powers and Ms. bennett we had talked about the possibility of using Marion Square Park for, you know, a little stopover while we're trying to sort all of this out. Um, and with this declaration saying no parks, um, does that cause a hiccup for that, the use of that park for this reason? Or or will you just come back to us at a later date with the with an amendment? Well, uh, a couple of things. Certainly, it, it's this, this is a work session and it's a draft uh, resolution. So you're... Uh, your discussion this evening will will help uh, will help guide uh, what is then on your agenda for your May twenty fourth meeting, and also as as was mentioned, uh, you know, our work to have people shelter in the areas that were approved by council, the unimproved portions of those two parks, has been ongoing, and and we do anticipate that our efforts if if that were the direction of council after the after next week's meeting if, if that's the direction of council we do uh, expect that our work to have people uh, move to appropriate shelter uh, will uh, be a, a very uh, uh, lengthy process uh, that it will not be a clean sweep on June 2nd. It will be weeks, if not months, to, to have people move to appropriate uh, shelters. And, and at that same time, uh, we will continue our work to add uh, shelter capacity, which, uh, as was requested earlier, we, we do have uh, you know, an update for you th this evening. Uh, and then to answer your question specifically, Councillor, uh, yes, if, if, if the if the sense of council, if the direction from council this evening is, is look at a different park, uh, we can bring a resolution back that would, that would allow that. Thank you. Trevor. 
So just for the <clears throat> sake of clarity, um, I just want to get my thoughts on this out there. I think I'm undecided on the date of June 1st uh, for a variety of reasons. I look forward to hearing more from city staff tonight. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if we're ready to take, and it, I don't know that it will be or that or if we're ready for this to be a step forward. Um, and I don't want us to, to take a step backwards. Um, I also have some concerns uh, that we, there was uh, creep from the original intention of this emergency declaration from a year ago in that we have people that are sheltering in the, the parks now that are in uh, areas that were never intended. The initial emergency declaration was in the um, undeveloped or unimproved parts of the parks. So, I mean, what I was kind of thinking of uh, or was hoping for is at June 1st that we start more strictly enforcing uh, camping uh, that's in those never approved areas. And then maybe changing the date from June 1st to another time so that I feel more confident that we have enough managed camping or more appropriate shelter online. Because I do think the, the likely scenario is that we'll see people uh, return to down, downtown. Now I may be incorrect on that, but that's what I'd like to hear from city staff um, and those people that are following this more closely. Where do we think people will end up, you know, if we pull the trigger on this and, and do this hard June 1st, I understand it'll take time, but where will these people go? Ms. Bennett, do you wanna? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, it, it might help to clarify, I, th I think that what we're hearing from each of you, as well as from people in the, um, in, in a variety of neighborhoods and communities is ideally there would be a place to go um, and a place to be, but that it no longer be Cascades and Wallace. Recognizing the um, impacts to the environment and the waterways and the lands and the trees and the neighbors and the surrounding communities of those parcels, the idea is can there be a different place for people to be able to be um, that works and meets folks' needs. And so we've been um, talking with a number of public and private property owners to try to locate alternative locations so that as, as this transition happens, we can, we can provide uh, restoration to Cascade and Wallace and open up different locations. Um, and yet that is um, regrettably slow and tedious work. It's not like I have, and we have eight spots that equal the square footage and the sites needed that would offer managed supportive camping opening June 1st. We do have, um, just to give you an example, if we take a conservative estimate of five managed options that we're thinking about, a couple of shelters and then a couple of other outdoor managed campsite spaces. And we, uh, and this takes into account our nonprofit capacity to manage um, things opening. Um, we did the math and identified that it would cost, for this particular package of five, $9.16 million that would fund through December of 2024 and would be estimated to serve 330 persons. To give you a sense of the kind of thing we could bring forward for your consideration in terms of alternative managed options to, to bring for you. I, I, think that, I think that what we're hearing with the parks is just at the heart of it that we really value um, important, respectful, trauma-informed communications with each person who was there at the park trying to problem solve with each person, what's an alternative, what's a next place, uh, a, a good option for you as you think about no longer being at Cascades and Wallace um, and wanting to help each person find a next step. Another key part of that would be important communication about COVID-19 vaccinations, mask availability, the importance of physical distancing and of not losing touch with the service providers that you, that you are in currently in touch with. So there's no loss of ground as there's shifts and shuffles that that would be a really important part of it. Um, we're hearing the objective with the park parcels would be to be able to restore those spaces for um, active use for all community members. Um, more greatly achieve environmental compliance at the two parcels 
and reduce issues around crime and garbage associated with the areas are, are the additional objectives that we're hearing to as we think about it and bring it all in. But there's a number of constraining issues. As someone pointed out, it's not as though we have a magic wand on June 1st. Um, if you think about um, some constraints that we have, for example, finding options that are meaningfully responsive to meaningfully responsive to what people need, we also have um, we also have um, to point out to Janet's point about some really difficult situations. I, I've I've been really hearing very compelling stories. A woman who's very catatonic, and you just can't really convey it, have a conversation. Uh, a woman who imagines a family. Um, she's she's um, come to an idea of a family in Europe, and I understand it helps her get up and have a purpose every morning to think about that. And her, and she has objectives around that family, which doesn't actually exist but it's difficult to make progress in other directions given, given her thinking. We have really serious behavioral health situations that are difficult to solve for um, folks that are staying there, but needing, needing solutions that meaningfully meet their needs. Um, we have co we, uh, other service constraints to the work specifically at the park include cost of contracted labor to be able to um, carry out the tasks with cleaning. Um, we don't have inmate work crews anymore. Um, we're paying attention to, to restrictions with overtime costs. Um, we're recognizing that the project would be a long operation. We're recognizing there's unforeseen emergencies that can affect the work um, in terms of we don't know, you know, you know, 2020, there's things that can come up that can that can affect the staff work as we work in each of the areas. Um, we have a lack of enforcement capabilities. Um, it's not as though we can compel people to, to do what we ask of them to do in, in many circumstances. And key to this is pairing the order of operations. So if I could quickly explain what we have in mind at the park spaces would be beginning and ideally ending with just a really person-centered engagement with each person, communications, problem solving, what's an option for you? How can we help you get there in partnership with the nonprofits that have built rapport? But understanding the significant barriers and the trauma issues that are in the way of that going well and the, the lack of appropriate solutions, we understand that's, that's not gonna end, end it there, although we would love for it to. That means the second step is we would take, we would post a specific part of one of the parks beginning in, as you said, Councillor Phillips, the developed areas, like, like as Councillor Lewis said, we started with a fir grove area, Wallace recently, and um, taking a particular part beginning in the developed areas um, and then working our way towards the, um, the less developed woodsier areas, kind of moving into the north ends, if you will, but not in that linear of a fashion. Um, including vehicles, as well as including the tents on land. So we would have to formally post a specific area. And then when the post notice ends, then we would imagine, um, we understand it's a trauma to have to move and that that can be a very escalating experience. So it's important for police to be present with us um, to help maintain order and calm and to help de-escalate tensions as they're arising. Um, but we would be um, asking people to not be in this particular part of the park section. Directly following that vacating, we would have our cleaning crew that would come in with the, with the constraints that I mentioned earlier, and they would clean that particular area, you know, remove any, any litter that's not personal property and have the area clean. And then we would need to kind of contain that by continually monitoring the space and coming back to it and making sure that it doesn't re-emerge again as a camping area. So essentially that order of operations is pretty important and, and needs to be coordinated to really be successful going section by section. I explain all of that by way to explain that it doesn't appear possible to do a complete, everybody is not there June 1st. You know, there's just, I, I think between the constraints that we see and the limitations of alternative locations, that would be the reality of it. What we're hoping is very quickly to be bringing you some site solutions that we can bring online if you're interested in investing in those managed site options that can be paired. So like, for example, there's a group of people who are 
connected into the church at the park at the south end of Cascades Gateway Park. We're working on identifying locations that the same church at the park could operate at a different location that as soon as you know you get that open that's a good time to work on that south end of the park and invite people to the alternative location uh so i i think that that would conclude those remarks and i want to see if there's questions Mr. lewis uh Thanks, Gretchen. We've talked a number of times. One, one step at a time. One step at a time. I'm curious about what's happening on the ground right now in Wallace Marine Park, and let's talk about underneath the fir groves. I was away on the weekend, and when I came back, there was no camping underneath the fir groves. They're still camping in the improved areas. My, my question is, where the folks that have left, where have they gone? And the folks that are remaining, are you hearing from any of them? I'm not moving. Thank you. So yeah, you're right. We worked in the Fir Grove area last week and the, um, the this week there is um, work underway to work under the railroad trestle and down by the boat dock area. Um, another part of the developed part of the park that we had never intended for there to be camping at. I don't have a specific situation report on where people went. That's a good question and I don't have an answer to that. Um, I'd like to know more concretely, but I don't. And yes, there's people, we, we, we're hearing significant, we, we hear people who say, I'm not going anywhere. This is, <laughs> this is where I'm gonna stay and this is where I'm gonna be. Um, hearing people say, I just don't know where else to go. Um, so we, we hear the gambit of responses. Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Gretchen. I sincerely appreciate all your work. Um, I agree with my colleagues that we need to identify other places for folks to go. We have, according to the city information, about 500 people sheltering at Cascades Gateway and Wallace Marine combined. And in the same city materials that we have, we see several estimated opening dates for glimmers of hope for many of these individuals. By mid-June, UGM will have another 150 beds. By August 1, there will be a mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency hotel program with 80 to 120 beds. By mid-July, there's a city outdoor managed camp with a city total, with 60 total occupancy. What I'm hearing is that we have things coming up on the horizon. So I echo my colleagues' concerns about, you know, having a gradual rollout. I think that we see more options coming online and we all agree this is not gonna be a clean sweep on June 1. We know that wouldn't be equitable. equitable. We know that would be traumatizing. What I'm seeing is that we have stuff coming online by August and possibly later on so I'm very much supportive of a gradual rollout so that people are not being bounced from one location to another. And telling folks that they have to leave Wallace and Cascade and having them go downtown, that is absolutely a step backward. And I am not in favor of that. Uh, to me, a street corner is far worse than a tent. Uh, there's far less shelter. You're much more exposed to the elements. Um, you can be preyed upon and so many other things that can happen when all you have is a street corner. So those are my thoughts on that. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate everything that Gretchen is doing to try to identify private properties. And I would encourage the private property owners, and I'm speaking specifically to those who refused to lease a space to us last year. Take a look at how successful the fairgrounds property was. Yeah. Clean, safe, spotless. We have a successful model now. Just talk to Church of the Park. Ask them how well it went. And please reconsider your unwillingness to lease to us. We need you to step up because we can't simply go out and start buying up real estate, not with the limited funds that we have right now. Um, and I also encourage folks to uh, do what we can to support tiny home prototypes. I know that, that uh, Gretchen and I believe Councillor Lewis and I have all taken a look at some prototypes put together by uh, a locally owned business here. And those tiny homes cost less than five grand a pop. And they can go in a variety of places that, that some places can't go. For example, they can be 
put on a floodplain, places where they would have access to solar so that it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg to electrify them and things like that. So um, I appreciate what you're saying. And those are my thoughts on where we're headed. Uh, I, I support gradual and trying to match as many people with resources as possible and to keep pushing. Uh, Gretchen, to follow up on Councillor Nordyke's uh, comments, we've got all of this. Is this something you're going to want us to act on, these various pages we've gotten on the whole variety of options? Uh, what is that exactly? Is that the... <laughs> what are we doing with this other... Because it has a lot of answers in it. It's a lot of background information for you. Okay. And then the second I get a site through a feasibility sort of legal test, I will bring it to you if it needs funding, if it needs approval. Um, the second I can get something through feasibility, I'm going to bring it to you because I'm really hearing that you want to be able to entertain an open alternative locations. Uh, Councilor so Stevenson mentioned a different park, for example, um, hearing that ideally it would be a location that would be for this purpose so we don't have to encroach on other parks. So I'm looking for sites that can give you a win-win in that regard. Um, so I don't have any decisions for you tonight, but the second I get a feasible option, I'm going to bring it to you for your consideration. Well, I think Councilor Nordyke, I think, uh, spoke for, for probably all of us is You've got such a tremendously uh, inclusive list. Uh, hopefully, we're looking at all of them, and and uh, and and we can be helpful in in uh, uh, getting them open as rapid as possible. I, I yeah, I, I, and also that one of those is not pitching a tent on our sidewalks downtown or putting out a mattress on a corner. It's how do we keep people kind of moving toward. Uh, housing and and are we is our timing in that resolution off for that is it too quick are we being too uh, ambitious in terms of moving people I, that's what i think we have to rely on you guys to tell us uh yeah councillor hoy thank you mr mayor uh, I want to uh, underscore what Councilor Nordyke said about uh, private uh, property owners who might have something available that we could take advantage of on a temporary basis, I, I think that um, that's really uh, something that would be helpful. I've encouraged folks. Um, so far, nothing has seemed to have panned out. And uh, Ms. Bennett, I appreciate all of the challenges that you outlined. I really do. And I know that they, you know, when you're dealing with human beings, nothing's easy. I was really hopeful that we were going to hear something a little bit more imminent uh, on an alternative location tonight. Um, a little bit disappointed that we don't have something either in place or just on the verge. And I, I understand sometimes it's not helpful to tell us about a specific location. I'm fine with that, but it would be really good if you could tell us you've got something that's just right on the horizon of an, as an alternative location. You don't have to go into detail, but it would be, I, we need to hear something is, is coming up soon. Yeah. I, I completely, uh, agree with my colleagues who have talked about a humane approach to this. I don't, we don't want to make this problem worse. We want to make it better. Um, we don't want un unintended consequences. We want to help people improve their lives. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that you have something for us to, to grab onto tonight in terms of a little bit of hope. Well, thank you. There's a few components that go, in, go into having something right on the horizon, the site availability, the nonprofit capacity and then in in the outdoor cases the actual shelter parts um, and of course your approval on the on on the components and we have two nonprofits that um, are willing to um, expand with us um, one in the outdoor arena and one with indoor spaces um, we have um, ideas for locations um, that are undergoing some feasibility review right now for both indoor and outdoor solutions um, that if activated the then we would have it and be and be pretty close to ready um, almost all of them four out of five I think are vacant right now so there's not like some sort of weight to, to remove the um, one of the things that could be a rate limiting step is just the time to onboard staff and to actually acquire the little shelters. Um, estimates of that 
have been roughly about 45 days that it takes to actually have that ready to go. Although I know people are working hard to try to accelerate that and take preliminary steps with the idea that we'll have a location and be interested in investing. In all cases, we need the operating funds to be able to do it. And in some cases, we need the ability to acquire the property or the land. And so there would be costs involved. That's that collection of if we wanted to invest in the five, the combo of indoor, outdoor, for example, the nine, what was that, 9.16 million to fund them through 1224 to serve 330 persons. That's an example of a grouping that, that we could take that, that's, I would say, on the close horizon if, if we're interested in all of those pieces. Thank you. And if I could just follow up, I, I, I mentioned during the budget committee process that I think we ought to have those uh, shelters on order now. I don't think we should wait for all the pieces to be in place. Yeah, I feel like we have contingency money. We have, we have. I think I'm hearing from my colleagues a commitment to be moving forward in that direction. I would not hesitate to have those things. I'm hoping that 45 days that we're that's already running and that those things are being manufactured on our behalf right now. And that, uh, and if you need some sort of formal action from us, please tell us because I'm sure. There are at least five of us, and I think probably there are nine of us who are ready to spend that money right now to get those th those things in place. Um, so, so I hope that we're not waiting for the perfect sequence. Like we can we can make that commitment, and, and if you need us to as a group make that commitment, we can do that next Monday. I think uh, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I'm just reading the room here and thinking that we're there. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, thank you, and I just uh, encourage you to. Don't wait, don't, um, let's not uh, make what, I can't remember what the saying is, but let's not wait for the perfect to do the, to do what's pretty good. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's move, we need to, I mean, I, I hear you're, you're talking about the 2024 and the big number and maybe that's it, but let's start taking some bites out of this thing. Let's not, vote, let's not worry that it's so big. Let's just start moving forward. And, and even if you only, you've only got a spot for 30 people coming up, you know what, that's 30 people that we're gonna help and 30 people that'll be better off than they are today. And that's what the kind of, that's what we just have to keep doing and just keep doing it. And hopefully that'll just build and build. And so anyway, thank you. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. Thank we you. also have uh, private funders that are watching very closely. And if we start turning to them saying, we've got something, uh, we will have funding uh, come in from the private sector as well. Uh, but we have to, all we have to do is have something uh, to, to show. And I, I think we still have uh, a, an incredible story to tell out of the fairgrounds uh, this past year. That was an absolute winner. Uh, and that kind of indoor managed camping uh, was a remarkable model. And, and the story of people coming out of there to go to work because they could have their possessions protected. Uh, we've had really good response uh, with uh, folks that we've talked to. I think, don't you, Councillor Hoy? I mean, I think people, when they hear that story, love it. Absolutely. I, I know that we were able to tell that story to the governor recently, yeah. and that was, uh, that was compelling. And, and I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think we're gonna see some, some interest from the state as well with uh, if we can figure out exactly what we want to ask for, I think there's some interest in land. Uh, the fair's over in September, uh, and that that set of buildings, and there's a whole range of different kinds of buildings out there. There's, I mean, I think there's real opportunities all over. Then the other one you mentioned, and I don't, I don't know if the council caught this one, but putting us a managed camp in every ward. I don't know if they all are going to vote for that, but I think that was an interesting perspective on seeing this as a shared community responsibility. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure I'm not missing something, but the outdoor managed camp at Portland Road also is something that I think we yeah. can show as something that works. So we've done it inside, we've done it outside. And I want to follow up on something uh, Councillor Hoy said, as the former director of the Salem Realtor Association, I'm begging the commercial realtors to help us out. The, you know, I, I recognize the risk um, and, and the, the attitudes, 
but this is a crisis that the entire city needs to address. And, and there are opportunities out there if we could just get people to help out. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of questions. One, I just want to say, first off, I agree with with all my counselors here, and and every time somebody else speaks, I'm I'm cheering. Yes, I I you know want to get that point across too. So I love how we're having this time to kind of get all of our thoughts out there together. Um, a question for you, Gretchen, is what does a feasibility study entail? Yeah. Thank you very much. I need to check and see if the property owner is open to the idea of having sheltering happen on their land. Um, need to see if the zoning and land use laws um, allow for it or if there's a mechanism or a maneuver to adjust that we can bring to you all to, mm -hmm. to make a change to allow for it. In some outdoor cases, I've lost sites and feasibility due to them being too marshy or wetlandy um, beyond what can be livable. So um, you also want to check and see if the land is um, sensitive from a tribal perspective. And if so, you would just make extra plans for how to potentially mitigate those impacts. But that's really it. Um, you're paying attention to other factors, you know, uh, geography, proximity um, to other things. But those, those are the primary ideas. And then the second I get something through that, I, can, I get to engage with the neighborhoods, the communities, the nearby um, community to talk about, well, what would be a way to do it here that would be workable for you? Okay, I have a couple more questions if that's okay, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Um, and I, I wrote down as I think um, Hoy was talking about buying these uh, shelters in advance, you know, kind of like you know, the federal government bought uh, vaccines in advance before they were even completed, right? Um, to, to get that infusion of cash uh, to let them give them some security that this is going to happen. So yes, I'm I'm all for that. Um, and then where are we at on the on the properties that we do already own? You know the the areas that um, that the city already owns that we could just right away. Um, is that something we could just kind of open up right away? Well, there's two. Is there two on my short list that that I'm um, potentially about to bring to you? I'm I'm checking on you know, insurance requirements and things of that nature related to um, the city's ability to have sheltering occur there. But I'm very close on two of the properties that the city owns. I have this spreadsheet. I wish I knew how many pieces were on it. We've, we've run with the IT department and the geographic information systems people a really detailed report on everything the city owns. And we've been scouring it looking at the different rules and size of parcel to see if there's anything that we own that would be suitable um, to do some sheltering on. But I, I do have a couple to bring to your to bring to your attention, hopefully soon. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, we, we tried and I think, I don't know how this affects you, but there was a, the city did look at having a warming shelter over at Pringle Hall and got really substantial pushback uh, from the neighborhood and that, it really creates, I think, in terms of the feasibility too, kind of how, how, how strong does everyone feel about all this? How far can we go on some of these, whether it's city properties, uh, you know, dispersal or, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it's something we all as, as members of the council have to kind of look in our hearts and see how committed we are in this effort as well. And Pringles right on a neighborhood street in, you know, with, how literally house is right there. And we've been looking for zones that are a bit different than just yeah. being physically on a neighborhood street. If I'm not saying that as eloquently, we, we need to get Bryce on here with his yeah. slides because broadly there is real interesting questions about how do you cite locations and Bryce and um, the community development team have done a great job of learning from other cities what are you finding that's working and important um, as you cite locations? And so that's those other documents that Steve mentioned that we wanted to get your, um, get, you know, give you a chance to start to take a look at while they're in draft form. I have a follow-up from that, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so um, for you, Gretchen, my question is, I guess, what defines right up against, and maybe this is for a planner, um, a neighborhood because, you know, the fairgrounds is right up against a neighborhood, right? I mean, all of these places in town are going to be in a neighborhood. And so um, that would be my pushback there um, and, and maybe a question to be answered. 
Um, but then also to, to the mayor's point, and what I've been working on doing with my uh, neighborhood associations is really just calling people up. You know, we got to be our best selves right now. We're, we're, your city is requiring a lot of everybody. So, you know, this is, go this is what's going to happen. You know, we're going to have movement of people. We're going to have, you know, uh, housing opportunities or sheltering opportunities all over town. And, and are we going to be that welcoming neighborhood? Are we going to be here to be part of the solution? How can we help, right? And so I think that's, as counselors, something that we can also do, lead by example in that way. Thank you so much. With the fairgrounds, it seemed to be um, a longer driveway and the pavilion was further set back within the depth of the campus of the, of the fairground structure. Um, the Pringle Hall is closer up to the actual street, but it's, it's subjective, like how many feet, what's workable, what works for the community, and I'm, that'll all vary and be subjective. Councilor Hoy? Thank you, and I just have a follow-up to a couple of the previous uh, comments. Uh, for anybody watching who thinks that we don't have homeless individuals right now today in every neighborhood association in the city, I think you're mistaken if you, if you have that belief. And so my question is, would you rather have that would you rather have folks who are in a managed situation and humane conditions, or would you rather have them have it the way it is now, which is not so great? So when you're thinking about whether you want a, a shelter near you or not, uh, think about it. How is it now? And how would this be better or worse? What do you think? In my, in my assessment, the current situation isn't really, isn't working so great. And so let's let's get these let's get more places in a more managed and thoughtful way where people can thrive and and go on to their next phase in life and and let's help people out of this situation. And the, the, what we're doing now isn't isn't cutting it like like has been mentioned when people can't leave their property for fear of it being stolen, you don't you don't get to go to a job you don't get to go to appointments you don't get to go to any of those things having a managed solution is like the first step to help people build and, and, and build their way out of this. And, you know, when, when people don't have families or other community resources, that's what the managed location becomes there. It's that one stable place where they can build from and without it, they don't have anything. And so that's when I love when Councilor Stapleton is calling on people to be our best selves. That's what we're talking about. If that's the community coming together to be the support for people who really need it. And we see what it's like when they don't have it. And that's where we're at today. Yep. Thank you. I oh, go, go ahead, Gretchen. Oh, I was, I was gonna see if we wanna bring Bryce in for a couple minutes, but I don't wanna interrupt Councillor Lewis. Yeah. Uh, no, I um, actually it's a good time for, for Bryce. What I'm hearing from the council is let's, let's push the envelope. Let's get some places that Maybe you're close, maybe not, but let's let's get some things on the board so we can make a decision to do something. And and by the way, these alternatives you've given us are great. They're just excellent. I mean, you can go through each of them if you could just figure out where to put it and how to fund it. I mean, they're just really interesting. So I think there's some stuff to be real excited about in there. It's that it's that next step. Bryce, you're gonna help us on that next step. Where are you gonna put all these homeless camps? Well, you know, we'll, we'll try to do that in the, in the framework of the zoning code and, and make Excellent. it work. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Mayor Bennett, uh, Bryce Bishop with the planning division. And so I do have a, just a, you know, not to belabor, but I just have a few, uh, few slides. Let me bring up my PowerPoint here. And uh, it kind of goes over uh, the different alternatives that we've looked at. And so in your packet, you have, you know, the four handouts that identify, you know, kind of the four basic types of uh temporary shelters that we're looking at and very much in line with what all the counselors are saying this evening, trying to get people out of this terrible condition into a more stable, managed, secure, uh, loving environment that can be a stepping stone to, you know, better and, and things for their lives and better for the community overall. And so staff has been working, you know, on, on looking at what other jurisdictions do in terms of how they address temporary shelters. And, you know, there seems to be, you know, kind of four main categories. There are, you know, uh, Many, many villages or many structure villages like tiny homes, Conestoga huts, 
uh, uh, pallet houses, all sorts of different prefabricated you know, small structures that are portable that can be moved in and you know sited on a property and provide you know you know a more stable you know type of housing uh, than what people are currently experiencing with just tents or on, you know without any you know uh, shelter at all on street corners. Uh, the need for these amendments are you know one the code as it's drafted today really doesn't envision you know providing a, a, a huge variety of different ways to address homelessness because it's not something that the community strives for and, and when you're in the middle of a crisis like this it really you know goes to show that the, the shortcomings of the development code and the fact that we have regulations that kind of date back you know to a time when you know the limits of the limits on the number of people in the shelters is limited the types of shelters are just limited to the traditional shelters so it really doesn't you know meet the need that we have you know in our community today so the the need to amend the code is really important to allow for these alternative types of shelters that are different than like shelter space in the UGM or St. Saint, Saint, Saint Vincent de Paul. So there's just a, you know, a, a need in the code to, to address this. Uh, so based on the code today, you know, we allow you know, these types of shelters through emergency declarations, which is not a, a sustainable way to do it. So we're looking at putting requirements in the development code uh, to allow for these additional shelter options to provide a clear process and to provide more predictability and then hopefully you know, meet the community's needs. So again, we're looking at kind of four different you know, concepts of sheltering at this point. There's the micro shelter villages, urban camping, which is would be intense, uh, vehicle camping, which is recognizing the city's existing car camping pilot program and expanding that in terms of the number of vehicles a little bit, then also provisions for warming shelters. So these types of uses really aren't addressed in the code today, and we're trying to fix that with the amendments we're looking at. Great. So in terms of uh, the first type, you know, micro shelter villages, these are essentially, uh, you know, again, prefabricated portable structures on the slide here. There's examples of pallet houses, tiny homes in the middle, Conestoga huts, you know, in Eugene is an example. And they're arranged on a site where there is, you know, an on-site management, uh, on-site management and staff. Uh, there are support services, uh, potentially areas for food prep, secure covered storage, and all the things that individuals need to, you know, have that, you know, sense of security in a better sense of home than they have otherwise. And so in looking at other jurisdictions, we've, you know, kind of, it seems like 30, you know, is a good number. We've looked at Medford, Eugene, uh, Corvallis, you know, you know, communities in Washington, uh, you know, you know, what's happening in California, like Los Angeles County and all in different areas. And it seems like 30, you know, is a good number. And then out of the 30, the maximum that we would be allowed on a site, you could have, you know, two adults per shelter unit. And I think there is a concern about if we're talking about adults, what about children? And uh, because we have seen some questions when, you know, some people have seen these amendments that in terms of providers, well, why couldn't, you know, a mother and a child be there or an, a father and a child? And it kind of comes down to the, the issue of liability. And if you have uh, minors on the site and being managed on a property and there's potentially like sex offender issues on the property that, you know, a lot of uh, the nonprofits and organizers of the of these uh, and managers of these communities, you know, try to avoid that issue, you know, of having minors on the, on the premises. So that's kind of where two adults comes from. In terms of where we would envision these being allowed would be- would you, in, Bryce, just for a second on yeah. that, would you then be recommending that we establish certain sites that uh, allow for children specifically? I mean, that they are mom and the kids, dad and the kids. How do you address that? Yeah, these are very these are very draft as as um, okay. city manager powers indicated. So there are definitely lots lots of issues that still need to flushed out need to be flushed out, and we still need to meet with community partners to you know and our managers to find out how will these work and what works for the city of Salem because what work what works for other communities may not work here based on our capacity and expertise. Uh, but certainly, yeah, that would be in a, you know, having a place for, you know, families with children would be you know a need to address and whether you know that could be through you know. Uh, you know, maybe specific ones are designated only, for, you know, outdoor shelter managed areas or, you know, for designated for that, that type of population. You know, there's probably a, a variety of, you know, ways to do that. But yeah, that is one certain thing we need to definitely address when we when we look at this. Uh, so does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Uh, in terms of where we would be proposing to allow the micro shelter villages, it would be any any non residential zone and within residential zones, specifically on properties that are owned by a religious organization, uh, because oftentimes you have you know community their community partner that does really you know want to help and that need in the community you know 
Corvallis allows, uh, you know, tiny, you know, village, you know, tiny structures on, you know, properties, you know, on church properties, on parking lots. And so allowing them in residential zones on churches makes sense. And then there'd be some other requirements about, you know, being having frontage on a street because you need to have access for garbage trucks and everything to pick up, you know, waste. And, you know, you need to have, you know, access, you know, for folks to be able to get on a street and the sidewalks to go get services. And uh, so access to transportation is important. So, and th these, these slides are just very, you know, pared down, you know, summary of the more detailed, uh, you know, summaries in your handout that have more specifics in terms of, you know, the loca additional location requirements, the type of support services that would be provided. Uh, but again, it would be mainly for zoning, any, any non-residential zone, and then limited in residential zones uh, to uh, church properties. Uh, in terms of the duration of use uh, for the microfix shelter village, it would be, you know, up to, you know, a year, and then there could be a, a, a uh, one a series of up to four one-year renewals for a total of five years. We've gotten some feedback that, you know, since these are more of a, you know, type of permanent, you know, more, you know, a better, a longer term duration, I guess, the structure is more durable, could be there for a longer period of time. Does it make sense to just limit it to, you know, four years or could they be there longer if they've had no, no issues? So that's certainly something we could consider. And then, of course, with all of these, uh, they have to be operated by either a public entity or a nonprofit entity, uh, and then they have to provide a range of support services. Uh, and, and on the on the handouts you have, those in, include you know restrooms, potential access for shower facilities, lawn access to laundry, you know facilities, hand sanitizing areas, a place for individuals to have you know supportive case management work occur on the site, or if they need medical treatment there. And so there's just an, a variety of uh, support services that are, are important, you know, with these uh, facilities to help people, you know, not only just be sheltered, but help to solve the, the problem and get them moving on to better, better and, 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 and more su sustainable housing and get the support that they need to get out of the cycle of homelessness. So those support services are important. And then there would be site standards that deal with perimeter setbacks, maximum height of structures, and other things that would deal with, you know, kind of the potential impacts on the site of the site and how it relates to the surrounding neighborhood and trying to having appropriate standards for setbacks and height limitations and screening so it doesn't create an impact, you know, on this, you know, surrounding properties. So that's the micro shelter village. Urban camping is another category. It, essentially, it's all of the same components that the micro shelter village has, except for it would be limited to, you know, 10 structures that, that are going to be more temporary in nature. Um, and therefore, they're going to have a little bit of, we're proposing a, a more limited duration of, of, you know, six months at a particular site, but then they could renew, you know, annually and then bring it back for another six months the following year. Uh, and, and so pretty much all the same, you know, standards and operating requirements and management requirements, except, you know, the structure, the type of structure, you know, is, is different as opposed to, you know, more permanent, uh, durable, uh, tiny structure or small structure as opposed to, you know, more, uh, less long-term, uh, a structure that's not as suited for long-term, you know, human habitation. And then the next group would be vehicle camping. As, an, as I mentioned earlier, this would be a, yeah, an expansion of kind of the vehicle camping or safe car camping program that we currently have in the city. It would allow eight vehicles per site, uh, one family per vehicle or two unrelated adults per vehicle. It'd be allowed in similar all the non-residential zones or on you know church properties in residential zones. Uh, it would be uh, it'd have to have an on-site management with west, restrooms and waste, you know, pickup, you know, services provided, you know, to minimize impacts and uh, some very, you know, basic site standards in terms of what happens if you want to add to your parking lot to, to provide places for, you know, RVs or uh, cars to, to park. And then Bryce, finally, uh, oh yeah. Councilor Hoy had a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just <laughs> to clarify, to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, on the where allowed, is there anything there that would uh, prohibit, say, a governmental en entity or like, say, a school district or a county or something like, or any sort of business from using their property for any of these? Are there any anything that you're proposing that would eliminate that possibility? Uh, no, it would be the zoning and, you know, the other locational standards about the street access or uh, on an arterial or collector being within, a, you know, a certain like a quarter mile of transit. Uh, but if it is, if it is on a, uh, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the car camping, 
uh, you know, it's currently, we have language in the pilot program that talks about it being on a, uh, on a property owned by a commercial entity or something. But I think the critical aspect of whatever we do here is that they, that they're managed, you know, it doesn't so much, it, it's the, is the zoning correct, you know, get the zoning right. And then, you know, whether it's public ownership or private ownership, that it's ma it's managed by either a public entity or a nonprofit working with a public entity or the housing authority. So, because that it's the management expertise will, you know, they'll help minimize the impact not the ownership of the land itself. Great. So so let's say the school district had a, a vacant lot somewhere that they own. They could propose one of these at this point. Yeah, yes, if, if, if yeah, if, 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 if the, yeah, because of the, the public, if it was a public zone and, uh, you know, we, were, we are proposing, that's a non-residential zone, so it would be allowed if it met the other site locational requirements, but with street access and, and, other, and other things, yeah, then as long as they had a, there's a, a, you know, a designated management company or a designated management entity that had experience managing, you know, shelters, emergency shelters, yes, it could operate there. And the same with the county, like if Marion County tomorrow decided to open up something, their property for something like this. There's nothing here that would prohibit that. Yeah, we certainly don't want, we don't want these regulations to get in the way of, you know, allowing that at all, so. Thank you. And then the final one was, is warming shelters. Uh, again, we, you know, currently allow them under the, the code, you know, be it emergency declarations. Um, for this one, it's much simpler, uh, where people are there for, you know, overnight, you know, when there's, you know, adverse weather conditions and then so it would just be you know allowed in non-residential zones or in churches and residential zones the maximum number of people is just you know the maximum number that would be allowed you know under the approved building occupancy for the building under the building code to make sure that conditions are safe and meeting fire and life safety requirements um, and then they just have to have restrooms so that's that's kind of the easiest you know you know less you know they, they would have the least regulations associated with this and then it would be from like September to April of each year when there are adverse conditions, you know, that apply. And again, these amendments are all just to, you know, look at best practices, get them into, into the code and to, you know, so there's predictability and, you know, so people can look at the code and understand, yes, this is the type of use that's allowed here. And it's not necessarily just things that we have to do on emergency, you know, basis, basis. So. Great. Any any questions? Is this going to be a fairly, this is not going to be a real cumbersome process. As I recall, it was mentioned it'd be ministerial. I mean, it'd be an administrative decision. And uh, so, so you're, uh, yes, good. Thanks for pointing that out, Mayor. Uh, you know, the, the vehicle camping and the, and the, uh, and the uh, warming shelters are ministerial. Now, the uh, micro shelter villages, you know, that, that'd be a class two temporary use permit, you know, that, that would require notice, you know, and to neighbors and the potential ability to, uh, to appeal. Now that is something that, uh, you know, it, as long as the standards are clear and objective, we don't have, it doesn't have to be, you know, a type two process, uh, you know, but certainly, you know, if, if there is a type two process where notice is provided to neighbors, it, you know, it can become, you know, it can become a lightning rod and, and, and drag things, slow things down. Yeah. Will there be an application fee? Or will there be a barrier where somebody would really like to do it? They've got the right kind of acre or two or in the right place, but they they would be asked to, you know, a grand, a couple grand for a permit. We would so we would have you know with an application we would have a we would have an application fee, but we we we, we control how much the fee you know the fees are. You know we. So you know, that'd they, be one of the things small. brought to us would be the fee structure. Yep. For this. Yes. Yep. Good. I had a couple questions, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Virginia. Thank you. Um, so in looking at this earlier today, I was I was looking through the list and I was just kind of maybe seeing some limitations that I wasn't sure um, made sense to me. I guess we'll just start with that. <laughs> why not? Um, for instance, like with the vehicle camping, why would we put it into this that they had to be, you know, up on their license and registration? I know that might sound really weird. Um, but, you know, I grew up uh, in a family that didn't always have the means to keep our cars. <laughs> this might sound really bad. Um, you know, up on our registration. That's an expensive process. So for me, when I see this, I just see it as like a, a hurdle that maybe we as city council um, maybe shouldn't be the ones putting the hurdle in the place. I mean, I understand that that's a DMV issue. And I'm wondering if it is, and I'm, I'm wondering maybe what my fellow counselors think of this, um, maybe if that's something that we can just kind of let go of and let the DMV kind of handle that. And, and if we want to have a car camping location, a requirement of tags up to date wouldn't be a hurdle, I guess is the question. I have lots more of these, but 
I don't, I don't, maybe I'll just throw no, and, that and, out and, there. You know, these, 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 this, yeah, this, this type of input yeah. is really valuable for us. So we can, you know, help tailor this for what works, you know, for Salem. Uh, in terms of the license, you know, reg the registration yeah. requirement, that that's in the existing pilot program we have for car camping. So I just really kind of, for vehicle okay. camping, I just kind of moved it, you know, what we had and then, you know, we put it in the code. But yeah, you know, if that doesn't make sense, you know, and it's a, yeah, I, I can see that as, as a, as a barrier, you know, and I guess as a planner, I, I tend to like default to want to regulate, you know, a little bit yes. more. <laughs> so, but yeah, if any, any way I can get out of that mindset and try, you know, loosen, you know, loosen it up, yes. and, you know, I think that's helpful that to, to know if you, so if you see anything's on those lists, any items on the list you feel are just inappropriate, please let it, let me know. And then, you know, we can let us know and then we okay. can, you know, tailor that and, and, and not, not include them if there's not Thank a reason you. to have them. And I do want to say that I'm I'm fully like advocate for people to keep their cars registered. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Um, but like other things that I saw was that were interesting, I guess, is is why the time limit on the camping for a six month versus the others was a, a year and kind of an annual review. And this one said six months it's allowed and then we'll review annually. I I, I guess that was a, an issue where I was trying to make the two ends meet. Yeah, that's another good point. I guess with the with the tent, you know, and looking at other jurisdictions, there was a, and and you know, kind of case studies from different communities. There's kind of a feeling that um, depending, you know, if it's like located on a, on, a, on a church property, that you know, like have you know, there's somewhat of a somewhat of a burnout. You know, the, even the yeah. people that are helping to provide, you know, having you know, the, you know, the tents there for a period of time, it kind of you know, the, the providers can get burned out. And then there's also a benefit by having a limited time of even though with the tents it's somewhat disruptive, they do go to you know, they can if they go to, go to go to a different area and then be exposed to other members of the community that want to help. So it kind of helps to spread the the understanding of homelessness and and, and helps you know everybody to kind of understand the plight and, and and gives everybody a chance to kind of share you know share the share the burden or the load and, and to help out. Uh, so in a way for the the tents uh because they're not as as per as permanent or durable as the other shelters and easily removed at, at, you know or, or more easily moved uh you know it seemed you know there were limits you know on other jurisdictions it seemed to make sense especially kind of when you think about well if they're here all the time is there a burnout factor and then if you're if they move around in the community and gives other people a chance to help and you know maybe you know maybe you know that works and, and hopefully this is not like again an ongoing thing where it's permanent that we're going to you know tent tent you know outdoor managed tent spaces everywhere for for sure. eternity you know but uh but yeah certainly that's something yeah. maybe six months is appropriate and it should be a year across the board for everything yeah and i i guess my um response to that would be to aim for the the most vulnerable and say uh right we just talked about how moving is um, adds to trauma yeah. and so i understand what you're saying about you know spreading the burden and burnout those are all really like honestly real things that happen um but if maybe we could let up again of the restrictions or the timelines and let the site maybe come up with those you know if a church is saying hey we're willing to try this for six months then we're all good for that um but if a church is saying like hey like let's let's just do we're in this for the long haul we're gonna we're gonna step up and do that then i i think that maybe could we have maybe some flexibility with that i guess yeah um Another question that I had um, with the camping part of it, since we're there, is our, I didn't see anything in here on environmental factors. And I know Gretchen was talking about the feasibility studies, you know, marshy lands or whatever it is, um, environmentally sensitive areas or the tribal issue, uh, making sure that that's sensitive in that way. Um, uh, is that something that's going to be in the code? Yes, definitely. And so if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, not on the slide, because this, again, this is just, you know, trying to put a lot of stuff into, sure. into one slide, but if you look at the, uh, the summary for the, the tent camping, the four page handout, uh, there, there will be, uh, site requirements that they, in, in, in the code that have been fleshing out yet, yeah, we don't want them in environmentally sensitive areas, like in riparian corridors or creeks, yeah. you know, in floodplains, uh, you know, and yeah, the areas have to be well-drained. Uh, so yeah, because we don't want people to be in dangerous areas or areas that are just, you know, that are not healthy for like marshy and, you know, swampy areas. So yes, those are, those are all things the staff has identified and, mm -hmm. and those are considerations we want to, that we want to add, we would add. Okay, so last question. Sorry, everybody. Um, on the warming shelters, um, mm -hmm. I had a question about the restrictions on like hours and months because so much more now, right, with these warming, quote unquote, warming shelters, it's, it's turning into cooling centers, it's turning into, you know, getting away from smoke um, inhalation, like so many different environmental things that are happening um, in this day and age right now, that I'm thinking maybe warming shelters is kind of an, an outdated terminology. And, and the way that we limit 
for the months of the year or even the hours of the day, right? Because if it's a cooling shelter, it's gonna be during the day, yeah. uh, right? Or getting away from smoke, well, that's 24 hours a day, right? So all of those different things. And I'm wondering if there's flexibility in this for those types of things. Yes, there, there certainly is. And again, we're at the point where we're where we were we were presenting these concepts and everything's malleable at this point. And you know, we can tailor it to you know what we need and what we want. So yes. Thank it you for being patient with all my questions. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Nordyke. Oh, thank you. I don't uh, actually have a question. I would just um, actually, I'm thinking that I am supportive in general of the concepts and I really appreciate the, the great points raised by Councillor Stapleton. My hope is that if and when we're ready to roll this out, you know, making this a real priority on the city's website, social media, giving great talking points to the city councilors and the mayor to take to neighborhood associations, uh, reaching out to business groups like the Chamber of Commerce. I think that we need to really, once we're ready, push this information because we may finally have those hidden community partners who weren't sure about stepping forward, but now that they've heard that we've had some good outcomes at places like the fairgrounds, they may they may be willing to take that plunge. So I'm I'm in favor of you know rolling this out as quickly as possible, um, because yeah, I don't want to wait for everything to be perfect. Because if we do, that's just going to delay the pain and suffering for those on the streets. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I can't see anybody else. There we go. Now I can see. Is anybody else? Yes, Trevor. So just a a couple of comments on the, the most recent section, that zoning presentation. Uh, thank you, that was really good. Um, you know, just to get uh, my thoughts out there for the purposes of staff and everybody else moving forward, I'm broadly supportive of everything that was brought up. I think excellent count, uh, comments were made by the counselors that went before me. Um, I just wanna make sure that while we're moving to do all those good things, um, that you're also asking for, you know, what you need in the short term to make those things a success. So if you need more time or resources from us, like assume that you have them. I, I would assume that you do. Um, at least that's my perspective on that. Um, I, I guess, uh, generally speaking, I don't think we have any action items yet that we're discussing related to this, but it's a great conversation. Moving back to the, the resolution that was before us initially, um, I just have a couple of comments and questions related to that. Um, you know, one, uh, one of the reasons additionally why I'm uncertain as to that June 1st uh, deadline uh, that's currently written um, you know, as written in the draft, I know it's just a draft, uh, is because of the pandemic. I mean, the whole reason we're in this emergency declaration is the pandemic. And it's just still very uncertain. Like, I think we're all hopeful that we're at the beginning of the end. But is this like, you know, the end of the third quarter or are we like halfway through, you know, the two minute warning in the fourth quarter? Like, I, I don't know. And is waiting a couple extra months, you know, beneficial for multiple reasons, especially with that in mind. Um, I, I believe I've heard staff specifically mention that they're going to take those things into account in terms of, you know, making sure we don't lose track of people for the, the vaccine effort um, and for their healthcare efforts. But I I really think that that's just as paramount um, as sticking the landing when it comes to the, the overarching question of homelessness is making sure that we don't mess things up from, from a pandemic perspective as well. So uh, if, if there's any additional information on how you're confident that June 1st is okay on that, or if we're not confident, maybe we should push it back. Yeah. Well, we're two weeks away from it. I don't know what the current statewide uh, vaccination level looks like or how that uh, that you're really the expert on that trevor where are we going to be in two weeks i i don't know two weeks but i i know that the the hope is that in the middle to end of june that we would achieve the 70 percent uh partial vaccination right. um point so you know is is july 1st or august 1st you know a better uh time frame and then you know maybe i just don't understand because even if we stick with the resolution as written, I keep hearing that it's expected to be a, like a gradual rollout. So is there a way to codify that with language so that I'm more comfortable with it? Yeah, yeah. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Councilor Phillips' last statement kind of just summarized the issue. I feel like we're really getting hung up on that June 1st day, but 
in all the conversations we've had, we've talked about this being a rollout and a, it's sort of a demarcation point. I think it's, I think we all felt like we had to give staff a date and that's the date we came up with. But even Mr. Poole, when he's been before us has acknowledged that June 1st isn't the end, it's the beginning of the end, you know? And I, I, I think that it might be helpful to, to somehow memorialize that. So we all have a really clear expectation on what does June 1st mean? It doesn't mean the end of camping in parks, but it certainly means uh, the end of the current status and the beginning of the next phase, whatever that is going to look like. I, That's I just, a good way to describe it too, Councillor, is memorialize it is with the resolution, you may wanna leave your June 1st alone or change it to some other date, but uh, would be to have a, a very, very clear public explanation of how this will roll out uh, that is, is uh, given to the council as part of that discussion. I think we need to understand how this, because uh, if, it, if it has that, that drop dead date and things, if people get the perception, well, they're gonna clear the parks, where are they gonna go? It's gonna be this, it's gonna be that. Uh, we, need to, we need to allay that fear that we're not going down that road. We're looking for a different, uh, a different outcome. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the feedback we've gotten are people that they're sort of focused. The public is kind of because we yeah. put a date out there and we and which is good because we want a date out there because we really want to move to the next phase. But that doesn't mean it's black and white. And I think right. it's I think we need to somehow articulate that better. Yeah. What do you think, Gretchen? Is that? Yeah, I've been looking for how to how do you say that in in a less ambiguous way? It's like, okay, you know, technically June 1st comes and that, that means that camping would not be allowed, but we expect a process that's, as I described, how do you, how do you say that formally? I tell you what you've got is you've got 200, 200 to 300 people that you're talking about displacing. And, right. and I think you can, in anyone's... Uh, in anyone's world, talk about that in a in a way that is is very humane and and uh, systematic. I think that that'll be. I think it'll almost be sort of how do you want to frame that? Because because it'll be real. You just can't get two hundred fifty to three hundred people to pack up and move. You just can't do it. Well, maybe you can. But <laughs> I don't think any of us can. <laughs> May lead them out of the wilderness, Gretchen. Hey, anything else? Uh, How will this come to us then, Steve? What What's the next step here? What are we going to see next? Well, well there are several uh, next steps. Uh, one will be the resolution itself, and, and thank you for the questions. Thank you for the feedback, and we will we will either in the resolution itself, and then certainly in in the supporting materials and the communication of that resolution, uh, attempt to address all of the questions and points that were, were raised by counselors this evening. On, on the specific shelter sites, uh, I expect to uh, be back to you next week as well Great. Uh, with, with specific sites. Uh, thank you uh, for, for the, uh, you know, the direction that, that urgency and preparation and, and Will these be city-owned sites? I mean, I, I know you don't want to go, probably, I didn't sound like you guys want to go specifically where you're going, but are they city-owned sites that we yes. can? Okay. Yes. And then on the uh, code changes, uh, staff will go back, take in the, the comments that were, the questions that were received uh, this evening and uh, either come back to, I may request another work session or or some uh, additional uh, outreach and discussion with you before the actual code amendments would be uh, scheduled for first readings. We do, uh, and, and in working with Dan, we do have some ability to continue those through the emergency and then transition to uh, a permanent codification of those uh, uh, necessary additions to our, our sheltering uh, supply. Okay. Any anything else? Anyone wanted to check in with Steve on, or Dan, or Gretchen? Okay. Well, then uh, 
If there's no more discussion, then um, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the work session and let everybody go home. Or Thank you. close the bedroom door or whatever. Bye. Oh, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>